בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, we're back at Sunny Isles, uh, doing uh, our uh, Sunday night שיעורים, these uh, שיעורים, just so you know, all of you that are coming, you have a lot of זכויות in שמיים, apparently, because the שיעורים on Sunday are having, ברוך השם, a lot of success, a lot of סייאתי דשמיא, a lot of interesting חידושים, a lot of new people have uh, actually uh, started watching the שיעורים as a result of the Sunday שיעורים, um, ברוך השם, many בעלי תשובה, From the Sunday Shurim, I know just from the uh, lecture we did about wasting seed a few weeks ago, that alone um, had an impeccable result. It was, uh, Baruch Hashem, a lot of people are uh, doing the opposite of what the Erev Rav want them to do, which is they're doing tshuva. Why do I say Erev Rav? Because uh, in today's world, there's a lot of people that call themselves rabbis, Rav, But they say that uh, you cannot tell people about reward and punishment. You can't tell them about uh, the mitzvah of kedusha, which is uh, the issues of uh, intimacy, wasting seed, man and woman, and so on, homosexuality, Shem uh, Can't tell people the, the truth about it because it's too much for people, but the reality is the opposite. Every single person that is watching these shiurim, even if they themselves admit, listen, I can't do this right now, they admit it's true, which is unbelievable. Uh, but Baruch Hashem, I'm uh, seeing a lot of results from people that uh, are coming out of the woodworks now, uh, telling me they've been, uh, since they watched the uh, waste, original Wasting Seat Shiur a few years ago, uh, they started keeping their breed. Just last week, there was a half a dozen guys that I never heard from in my life. telling me they've been watching their breed for 10 months, for a year and a half, for six months, four months. Baruch Hashem, it's having a lot of results, which, uh, of course, uh, like anything else in life, if uh, you get results in something, uh, if it's worthwhile, you have to continue. You have to continue. And uh, according to the Zohar Kadosh, according to the Chachamim, the uh, generation before Mashiach is going to have two major tikkunim. two major obstacles to overcome. Uh, for the uh, men, it's going to be wasting seed, the issues of wasting seed and all of its ramifications, as well as not just wasting seed by a person by himself, but also with his wife as a nida, if his wife doesn't go to a mikveh, or uh, perhaps if he's intimate with somebody before marriage, every woman, uh, a Jewish woman, of course, that uh, he's with before she's married, That means she didn't go to the mikveh. That means that the Isur Nida, which is karet, it's one of the 36 crimes in the Torah that a person, if he doesn't do tshuva for it, loses his share of the world to come. Uh, needless to say, if he's with a, uh, uh, with a goya or a zona, a uh, non-Jewish woman or a prostitute, it's also wasting seed. Hashem Yerachem Aleinu is the amount of guys... that think it's okay to, to do such things is uh, impeccable. And I'm not even talking about the obvious secular-minded people. I'm talking about people that call themselves religious, that think it's okay uh, to go to all types of places where uh, they get a uh, massage and then uh, they, uh, they get something at the end, thinking, why, well, it's not a big deal. I'm married. I'm not marrying this other woman. It's not a big deal. And they don't understand that they just destroyed the entire Torah. They just destroyed the entire Torah. They destroyed the Otiyot HaKadoshot, the, the holy letters uh, of Kedushah that they have imprinted on their Neshama. And the Shekhinah ran away from them at that moment. Why? For 30 seconds of pleasure. So I see that a lot of people, believe it or not, more people are becoming frum. More people are actually doing tshuva, Baruch Hashem. It's a mamash yat nishmaya and it's uh, to your merit. More people are becoming from and starting to keep Shabbat, starting to keep Tarat Mishpacha, starting to keep uh, all of the other mitzvot as a result of starting with the most difficult tikkun, which is wasting seed. Which is unbelievable because most people say, listen, just get the guy to keep Shabbat, get him to keep kosher, and then uh, we'll get to the uh, hard stuff. It's unbelievable to me how many guys... are actually starting their tshuva with this difficult step. It's unbelievable. Mamash, it shows how the uh, purity of their neshama still exists, and they just want the truth. They want the hard truth, as difficult as it is. 
And once they see, oh, this is real, okay, I'll take the rest too. Why? Because the neshama at that point became purified. They're not wasting seed anymore. So now when they hear about Shabbat, the neshama can accept it. They hear a shiur about parashat Shavua, the neshama can accept it. They hear about alacha, the neshama can accept it. Why? Because they cleaned out the vessel. The vessel that holds their neshama, and uh, that vessel is now becoming little by little pure and pure. And they're seeing results, Baruch Hashem. Results in Parnassah, results in Shlom Bayit, if they're married, uh, results in uh, everything else in their life. The physical aspect of it takes a little bit more time, where some guys that already started uh, getting some of these uh, side effects, physical side effects that I talked about in the first, in the original Wasting Seed Shiur about three years ago, uh, we went into the medical aspect of it, and how there is a, a book that was written about 180 years ago, that talks about all of the uh, physical consequences of a person that wastes seed, uh, all types of ailments, all types of uh, losing hair, uh, pain in the bones, all types of uh, sweating, bad smell, all types of disgusting things that people think, no, no, it's because I'm stressed out. No, no, it's because I'm getting older. No, no, it's because of this. No, 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 it's wasting seed. It's wasting seed, that's what it is. To such an extent that the Zohar Kadosh says all of a person's problems, all of them, his wife, his kid, his panasa, his uh, you know, bad leg, bad arm, bad eye, bad this, all of his problems come from wasting seed if he's wasting seed. If he's wasting seed, all of his problems are from this. Not from it's not even from Khilul Shabbat. All of his problems start there. Why? If you're not doing that, everything else is tafel anyway. Everything else doesn't matter anyway. And the reality is that you can't say, oh yeah, what if he's not wasting seed? You can't say that. You can't say that loudly. Why? Because if he's not wasting seed, usually he's a very holy person that's not doing such bad things otherwise. Which means that the difficulties he has in his life are difficult, are different. They're not necessarily the same level of kaparat avonot that many other people get uh, as a result of their sins. Uh, so the tikkun for men in the generation before Mashiach is the uh, tikkun abrit. The tikkun for women is modesty. What do I mean? It seems like what's the word? How how could this two compare? Okay, he has to change his entire uh, life and how comfortable he is and uncomfortable he is with his own body. She just has to put some clothes on. What's the big deal? The big deal is Abutai, anybody that had uh, the uh, courage to read the book that uh, we posted, the free book that's on our website, bezatashem.org. On our store, uh, Guarding Your Eyes and Tikkun Abrit, 192 pages of Kedusha, has a section in there specifically for women that every woman should read. Every, in reality, every person should read the whole thing, but if it's a woman, she should start with that section. It's towards the end of the book. Anyone that reads it, which we'll go over some of it today, Bezat Hashem, will see how much of a partner she is to, in the crime to such an extent that there are many opinions that say she's actually worse than the guy meaning she's more uh, responsible for what the men do than the men are for themselves obviously every person is responsible for themselves but meaning that what the sages are trying to teach us is that there's no free lunch for anybody you think that uh, you dressing uh, immodestly and acting uh, in a provocative way, in a flirtatious way, it's not a big deal. And the fact that your wig is getting longer and longer, and your skirt is getting shorter and shorter, it's not a big deal. Because you call yourself a, uh, you know, a religious person because you keep Shabbat, and you eat chulent, and you uh, light some candles. Uh, the reality is quite different according to our Torah. Reality is quite different according to our Torah. So tonight, unless you guys have some serious questions... We're going to take the uh, opportunity to continue this issue uh, with obviously with some new things, uh, with some new things uh, about the Tikkun Abrit. Uh, this is uh, also called Yesoda Kedusha. Yesoda Kedusha meaning it's the foundation of holiness. When Hashem in Parashat Kedushim said, Kedushim Tiyu, Ki Kedush Ani. You be holy because I am holy. Chazal says, what is he talking about? You be holy. What, what can you make you holy? Why, if you pray 87 times a day, it makes you holy? No. If your beard, you grow it from here to Arkansas. 
It's going to make you holy? No. There's actually uh, many uh, idol worshippers that have a beard longer and nicer than yours. If your keeper covers your whole head, not just uh, half, a quarter, no, you have a big keeper. You're like uh, uh, Abu Salam, you, you're Muhammad. You have uh, one of these turbans on your head to make you holy? No. Muhammad had a turban this big, but it was Rasha Merusha that killed people for fun. What makes you holy? What makes you holy is your actions. But now your actions in the Bet Knesset. Your actions in the Bet Knesset, very easy. Very easy to be a tzaddik in the Bet Knesset. Why? You're busy praying if you're actually there to pray. And even if you're not there to pray, you're one of these reshaim that comes to talk. You're one of these people that comes to talk and ruin the prayer for everybody else. I call a person rasha because that's what the Rambam calls him. Not because I... Uh, I have some type of animosity towards them. That's what the Rambam calls. Somebody like that, he calls him Rasha. Why? Shuchan Aruch says, the sin of talking in Beknesset is too big for you. Why? The entire Kehillah, the entire Kehillah's prayer is on hold because of you. What is it like? The Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah says something extraordinary. It says that if a person brings a korban, brings a korban to the Bet HaMikdash, he made a sin, korban chatat, or uh, he, may, he wants to do something good, he wants to uh, bring a korban for that, different different reasons he wants to bring a korban. He wants to bring a korban. Now, everyone knows the essence of something called pigul. Pigul means... If the person did made a sin, made a sin, he has to bring in the days of the Beta Mikdash, he has to bring Koban. Today we don't have Beta Mikdash, so how do we do Chuva? What do we do? We pray. We pray. That's how we do Chuva. So if somebody comes, he made a sin, he went out and he did something on accident, not on purpose. If it's on purpose, then they kill him. If it's a if it's a karet, something like that. But if an accidental sin, accidentally he turned on the light on Shabbat. Accidentally he forgot a Shabbat. He forgot a Shabbat. He woke up in a rush, ran to the bathroom because he had to go, turn on the light. Oh, I forgot Shabbat. I forgot Shabbat. He was in a hurry. So in a hurry to go, he forgot it Shabbat for a second. So it's an accident. So for that, he has to bring Koban. He has to bring a nice big cow, $25,000. For what? For an accident. Also shows you what kind of tzaddikim we had 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, that they admitted to an accidental sin. Us, we don't even admit to the ones on purpose person pe- murders people in, uh, in public and uh, with Lashon HaRa, Rechilut, all types of things. No, no, I didn't say nothing. What did I say? I only said that uh, you shouldn't go to a shiurim. That's all I said. I only said that, uh, you know, his wife is this. I only said that her husband is this. I only said that the possibility that they're thieves. What do you mean? The guy went bankrupt because of you. The guy went, did you have any evidence that he's a thief, that he stole something? No, I just thought maybe, I don't know, he just like he went from nothing, he already, 25 years old, bought, you know, bought a house for a million and a half dollars. I figured maybe he's stealing. So I said, you know, you should watch your back. Don't do business with him. Why? I don't know. Maybe he's stealing. Oh, so maybe he's stealing. You ruined his world. As everybody else got the one Lashon HaRa went to the other. Everybody shut their uh, business with him. Nobody wants to do business with him. He went bankrupt. He went shh, to the top and shh, to the bottom. Shem Rechem. Why? You were just checking. Lashon HaRa murdered people in public. People think, oh, no, I didn't do nothing. That's a purposeful sin. Now, Torah tells us that if a person comes to the Beit HaMikdash with a $25,000 cow, nice, juicy, delicious cow, he comes, he's not going to enjoy this cow. It's given as a korban. But in his mind, he's one of these fools that says, you know, in reality, I'm only giving this korban because I'm a tzaddik. Not because I made a sin. Not because I made a sin. I didn't really make a sin. But I, listen... Yalla, no, let's go. Let's just for Hashem. For Hashem, I'm like Hashem needs your cow. For Hashem, I'm doing this. You know, to show other people you should bring Kobanot. I'm gonna be a good example. Not because I made a sin. We call that Pigul. What's Pigul? Pigul means that this Koban is rejected. This Koban is rejected. There's no chuva, there's no nothing. He has to get punished. But that's if he does it himself. But the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah says something mamash dangerous. Dangerous for us not to pay attention to. It says, if the guy makes the mistake of not doing tshuva, brings a korban, we know, that's pigul. 
But what about if the Kohen himself, the Kohen, righteous person, Tzaddik, the Kohen himself says, you know, this Korban, we're going to eat this one. After we burn it, we're going to eat it, make nice steaks, filet mignon, I'm going to make, I'm going to make, the, he starts, oh, I'm going to eat this one. We're not going to bring this one to, we're going we're gonna to burn it for everybody. But we're not going to burn the whole thing. We're going to keep some for ourselves. He says that's also pigul. Gemara says that's also pigul. No tshuva. For who? For the Kohen? For the guy that brought the Quran. Yeah, but what did he do? He, he had all the right thoughts. He had all the right thoughts. But the Kohen didn't have the right thoughts. The Kohen didn't have the right thoughts. You lose anyway. What does that mean for us? In the time that we don't have a Bet HaMikdash, if you're going to a Bet Knesset that has a Chazan that likes to talk in the middle of prayer, that likes to talk to everybody and chit-chat in between Chazarat HaShatz, sometimes when he's not the one saying Kaddish, he likes to have a conversation. When we're supposed to be honoring Hashem, he wants to have a conversation among his peers. He wants to talk to the Rabbi. Maybe he is the Rabbi. He's talking to other people. Maybe he could get some money. Whatever he's doing. That's a pigul. That's a pigul. Why? His prayer is definitely not being accepted in Shemaim. Why? He's talking in the middle of prayer. But that, that's not enough. What is the Torah trying to teach us here? The entire Keilah, the entire Keilah, Gemara Masechet Ta'anit says, Daf 16, says the entire Keilah gets cursed because of him. Entire Keilah. Why? I didn't know he was going to talk. You should have known. You can't just go to any Beknes and say, no, no, this is my Beknes. It's closer to my house. Mamash, people have to understand you're going to go to a Beknes if the Chazan, if they put a Chazan that's not Yire Shamayim, doesn't have Yirat Shamayim, don't go there. Don't go. Why? You're going to go to get cursed or get blessings. Now, I'm not recommending people don't go to Beknesset. Avai, go to Beknesset. You need to go to Beknesset. But you need to go to Beknesset. That has somebody that's Yerashamayim. If he doesn't have Yerashamayim, go to the rabbi. Say, Kvod Arav, listen, I'm sorry to tell you. This is a Gemara. I saw it. Maseret Ta'anit, Maseret Roshana. I'll give you 15 other, other, other sources. It says somebody talks in the middle of the prayer is a problem. The Chazan talks in the middle of the prayer. Shemir Achem, Kvod Arav. I can't come here. A, I have kids. I have a wife. I have kids. Last thing I need is more curses in my life. Oh, if the rabbi answers like this. Ah, oh, no, stop being a fanatic. Stop being a fanatic. He's a nice guy. He means well. He's one of those. Run from the Beknesset. Why? The rabbi is the problem. It's not the chazan the problem. The rabbi is the problem now. Chazan is just doing what the rabbi taught him to do. So, in this generation, we have a lot of people that are confused. They're confused about what is it that they're supposed to be doing. And the Shiur Bezat Hashem will be for a Ilu uh, Nishmat, David ben Masuda, uh, and Refuah Shlema for David ben Nesriya, Doris bat Jora, Viola bat Jora, um, Elisheva Chaya bat Sara, Levana bat Sara, uh, Dvora bat Mercedes, and all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Nefesh, Refuah Taguf. We see here, Rabotai Yekarim, that the confusion that we have in today's world is not necessarily only our fault. Meaning, it's not only because we're ignorant and we choose to be ignorant. It's also because even if sometimes somebody tries to go to a shiur Torah or somebody goes on the internet, presses a play button on something that looks like a shiur Torah, he's not necessarily guaranteed to get a shiur Torah. He pressed play. The guy on the screen has a beard. The guy on the screen has a beard, maybe even some payers. The woman on the screen has a kisurosh. She looks like she's from the days of the Rambam. She looks tzadika. So he's assuming, she's assuming, ah, I'm seeing somebody that is at a big organization, small organ, whatever it is. They, they say the word Torah. They say the word tzadikim. They say the word Hashem. It sounds like a shiur Torah. It sounds like a shiur Torah. But our parasha, last week, parashat Bo, tries to give us an explanation of what's going on, Rabotai. It says, 
ויישאו בני ישראל מרעמסי סוכותה כ-600 אלף רגלי הגברים לבד, לבד מטף, וגם ערב רב עלה איתם וצאן ובקר מקנה כבד מאוד. In chapter 12, in last week's parasha, verse 37, it says the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children, meaning all the men between the ages of 20 and 60, the Gemara says. Also, the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, went up with them, and flock and cattle very much livestock. So here we see one of the original mentions of the Erev Rav Imach Shimam Vezichram that have been torturing us for over 3,000 years. Now, a logical, rational person would say, wait a minute, these Erev Rav, aren't they the same Erev Rav that I mentioned at Mount Sinai that they brought the Egel Azav, the golden calf? Yes. These Erev Rav, aren't they the same ones that caused problems for Am Yisrael from that moment all the way to today? Yes. So kill them! No, let's get rid of them. Let's at least talk. You know what? Don't kill them. We're, 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 we're liberal. We're, we don't want to kill people. Let's just say you go to your way, we go our way. You go your way. Go make your own religion. Go to Christians. Go to Muslims. Go to Buddha. Go to Atheist land. Go whatever you want. Go to hell. Whatever we can. Go somewhere. Leave us alone, Am Yisrael. Leave us alone. No, You're causing us problems, constantly going against the Shem. Erev Rav. Torah Kedusha is not saying, hey, this Erev Rav is always going to be distinguishable. It says, by the way, V'yis'u B'nei Yisrael, see B'nei Yisrael, they came, and the Erev Rav with them, meaning you can't tell the difference sometimes. Until you see the actions. It's in the same. One verse is next to the other. Why? Israel. Erev Rav. He looks like a Jew. He looks like a Jew. He acts like a Jew sometimes. He acts like a Jew sometimes. He has a beard. He has a beard. Sometimes you can't tell the difference. When can you tell the difference? When it comes to the Rega Shel Emet. When it comes to the moment of truth. What is coming out of their mouth? What kind of actions are their hands doing? What kind of actions are their eyes doing? What are they doing? Now, I'm not going to mention a name because the last time I mentioned a name, it actually worked against the Torah. Meaning that we mentioned a name of a certain kofel that was spreading heresy and still is spreading heresy among the world. But back when I mentioned him, he was only known by his locals. Since I mentioned him, for whatever reason or another, about a hundred more people subscribed to his channel. So even he's still nothing in his channel, but the point is that at least a hundred or 150 more people subscribe to his channel. I don't know, maybe they want to get a laugh, maybe they want to be heretics and go to gain. No, I'm not really sure why they subscribe to his channel, but the point is, is that since we mentioned this heretic's name, more people watched his channel. So this next one that I'm going to mention now, I'm not going to mention a name, and please don't ask me the name, because he's an unknown person, really, for the most part, except this Keila. But I could tell you, I could show you the video if you want, so you, if, you, if you question it. I saw somebody that looks more religious than anybody in this room. In fact, I saw somebody that looks more religious than anybody you know. The payers reach beyond the shoulders. Beyond the shoulders. Shh. Went. Straight down. He had the tzitzit from wool. You know, you're supposed to... Um, wool, wool, not just uh, tzitzit of cotton. It's a, it's a cooler. It's not, no, no. Tzitzit of wool on the outside. Meaning, he's expressing his Judaism. He has shurim on the internet. Every third word is a curse word. And I don't mean curse word like the light curses that you really shouldn't say. I'm talking about every word that you can hear truck drivers say. Every second word he curses. He tells people that he just wants to make sure that everybody becomes like him. What? Get married but don't have any kids. Waste seed. Go out with Goyot like he did. He's a rabbi. He went out. He says on the video, he says on his video, 
Yeah, I tried going out with someone that was in the process of conversion for two years, but then she failed the test, so I broke up with her. Wait, so what you're saying is that you went out and dated a Goya for two years, and you're a rabbi. You went out with a Goya for two years, and you're a rabbi. Shem Echem. And all types of garbage, filth coming out of this person's mouth to no end. Waste seed. The guy that brought this to my attention tells me that Hashem Echem, what this person is doing to the Keilah. There's already several married women that Hashem Echem fell for this guy. Married women. Single women that were betulot, were virgins. Hashem Echem. This guy is Mamash, a spiritual terrorist. But no one's doing anything. Why? People are afraid of their own shadow these days. Or maybe they don't see that there's anything wrong. I'm not really sure what's wrong. All I know, Rabotai, is that the filth in the world today from Erev Rav is not decreasing. And the only way to win against the Erev Rav, the only way to win against the Tum'ah of the world is by bringing more Kedusha. We can't go to places and start killing people. We're not Pinchas. We're not in a generation of Pinchas. You can't go out there and start killing people. That's not what we do. We can't go out there and start beating up people. That's not what we do. We have to bring more Kedusha. But that Kedusha starts with the Yesod. Yesod means the foundation. If Am Yisrael does not have the Yesod Kedusha, we have nothing. As the Zohar Kadosh says, a person could literally fulfill the entire Torah. And the Yetzirah can help him. Help him finish another Masechet. Help him do Mitzvah Tfilin. Help him keep Shabbat. Help him give Tzedakah. Help. Yetzirah is helping. I'm not saying Hashem help. Hashem, Hashem is watching this whole thing. He's saying, my son, I hope you, I hope you pass the test. I hope, Hashem is praying for him. I hope you pass the test. I hope you pass the test. Why? Because I'm making everything easy for you. The problem is Yetzirah is also making it easy for you. You have Parnassah, you have a Kala, you have a this, you have kids, you have money, you have everything. The Yetzirah is helping him. Why? He says, give me your Brit. Give me your Brit. You're doing the whole Torah, but you're wasting seed. Every single mitzvah the person does gives power to the Sitra Achra. Gives power to the evil inclination. Gives power to the Satan himself. He is a better employee of the Satan than someone that murders people for fun. Because he's generating Kedusha, and the Kedusha gives power to the Satan. That's how much the Yetzirah wants a person's Kedusha. How much he wants his Brit. A woman who does not watch her self as far as modesty is concerned whether it's modesty in the way she behaves when she's intimate with her husband or modesty when she's out in the street going to the supermarket or going to work or taking the kids to school and she wants to make sure that every Steve and Joe look at her on the way there she has no idea what kind of damage she's causing in the world but I don't just mean in the world that she never saw before unless she had a near-death experience, which most likely she won't commit that sin anymore, after she did, but rather the world that is called her children. The world that is called her children for every normal mother, her prized possession, the most important asset that she has in her life is her children. And a woman does not know what kind of damage she's causing to her children when she's not modest. We think, oh no, okay, so I sin, so I get damaged. Now, okay, so one day I'll do tshuva. What does that have to do with my kids? Bezrat Hashem, today we're going to go over some of the things that have to do with Kedusha that will show Am Yisrael that to do tshuva for the Yesod, for the Brit, for the modesty, you're not doing anyone a favor other than yourself. In fact, the more you learn about this topic, the more you learn about this topic, the more you start saying to yourself, even if there's no reward whatsoever, they're not going to call me a tzaddik in Olam Abba. They're not going to give me any more rewards. They're not going to give me 310 or nothing. They're not going to give me nothing, even though it's a huge reward. The amount of reward that you can't even comprehend. But even if they don't give me a special crown as a woman, they give me a crown as a woman because I was modest, and they give me a special world, no, they don't give you anything. The more you learn about this mitzvah, 
the more you say, Hashem, even if you don't give me anything for this mitzvah, thank you. Thank you for forcing me to do it because of how much damage I would have caused myself and the people I love for not fulfilling it. To begin, we start with Orach Chaim HaKadosh. Orach Chaim HaKadosh, Rabbi Chaim ben Atal, was about 350 years ago. One of the Kedoshim from Am Yisrael, there was not only a Kadosh in his generation, but was considered one of the Kedoshim in all of the generations. From the time of Moshe Rabbeinu until today, this is one of the people that his Torah was accepted among all traditions, among all sects of Judaism. Many of the things that we learn today when have to do with mysticism and midrashim and so on, you've heard his, his Torah before in my shurim and I'm sure in many other people's shurim. To give you an example of what we're dealing with here, the Baal Shem Tov lived in the same generation and they tried to meet. The Or Chaim HaKadosh and the Baal Shem Tov, they tried to meet and many say that if they, if they would have succeeded in meeting, they would have brought the Mashiach. The Kedusha that came from both sides of the world was so extraordinary. He said if they would have succeeded in meeting, they had the power to bring the Mashiach. Just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, or Rabbi Chia and his, and his children, and many other tzaddikim in throughout history, Mamash had the power to bring Mashiach by themselves. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh said one day during Sudash Lishit, oh, the light, the western light of the world was just put out, was just shut down. So his Talmidim says, Kvodarav, what does that mean? He says, Or HaChaim HaKadosh just died. He says, Kvodor, how do you know? He says, because there is one sod in the world, there's a secret in the world about the mitzvah of Netilat Yadayim. Washing your hands is a sgula special zgula about Netilat Yadayim, that heaven only gives, exposes, or discloses this secret to one person per generation. And I was just given that secret because he died. Or Chaim had it until now. He died. I was just given this secret. To such an extent, this holy sage of ours it's not just anybody that you read about in books. Oh, wow, it's a nice chidush. Many, many stories are told about him. Things that he did, things that he saw, things that he said. And he talks extensively about the issue of kedusha. But not in a way that we've heard before. A little bit different. Doa Chaim on Parashat Tazriah, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 2. The verse says, it's a, it's a parasha that starts with the issue of Nida, the mitzvah of Nida, a woman that's impure because she has a menstrual cycle, and she's a surah to Baala, she's not allowed to be with her husband for that time that she's bleeding, and then... After that, seven more days, and then she has to go to the mikveh, and then she has to, and then they're able to be together. So approximately half the month, a woman is not allowed to be with a husband, some women more, some women less, depending on, on their body, but it's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 12 days a month that a woman is forbidden from a husband. Now, this chapter says, has a verse, chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Asher ki tezriya ve'alda zachar. When a woman conceives and gave birth. That's what the verse says. A woman conceives and gave birth, and it's also, she is now impure to her husband. As soon as a woman, if she's pregnant, as soon as the water breaks, she's considered nida. So which means that this is a, in the beginning, was a very difficult mitzvah for us, but Baruch Hashem, we overcame it, is that as soon as my wife we had our first child, we had, to, we had to do this. You can't do this without a kid. So what happens? As soon as the water breaks, you now touch each other. Why, why, why is there such a big deal? You're not such a sick-minded person that she just had a kid. What are you going to touch now? You can't anyway, even uh, if you're not religious. It's not that. It's usually the 
when a woman is going through such anguish of bringing a child to the world, it's not an easy time. So the, what normal people or that don't have Torah, I call them normal in a sense of the secular world, think, oh, I should hold a hand, I should give a hug, I should be supportive. And you know, all the things that we saw as kids in movies, you know, the husband learns how to breathe also. <laughs> You know, he's breathing, she's breathing. It's like they're both giving birth. You don't really know who's giving birth because this stomach is bigger than hers. That's what, that's what we had. But the reality is, Rabotai, you're not allowed to even touch your finger. Why? As soon as the water breaks, you die. So this is very difficult for some people, especially in the beginning. Why? So it's my, it's my husband, it's my wife. I love him, I love her. Now let's touch. Now let's touch for a while. We're talking about, in many cases, uh, more than a month, two months, even uh, three, depending on when she stops bleeding. But Baruch Hashem, today, the, uh, if you go to a religious uh, doctor, uh, they know this, and they uh, try to ease the pain as far as the difficulty by uh, removing uh, most of the blood from the uterus uh, during the pregnancy, uh, because it doesn't hurt during that time. And so that shortens the, uh, the uh, recovery time as far as the, that's concerned. But either way, it's still a while. It's still a while. And uh, it's at a time where really you want to be the most uh, affectionate. You know, I love you. Thank you for bringing a kid to the world. Thank you for replicating one of us. Thank you for, you know, thank you. I love you. The, the minimum that a, a husband should do is say thank you. But in this case, he can only say thank you in words. So the mitzvah of Nida is not just when she's not pregnant. It's also mitzvah when she's about to give birth or after she gives birth and so on. And a person needs to know all of the rules. If you don't know all the rules, you're definitely failing. The Gemara says that a woman came to the Bet Midrash and cried. She, had, she cried. She cried to all the Tamidech Hamim. She, she had a, books in her hand. She says, this is the Torah and this is its reward. My husband was a Talmud Chacham, Tzadik, Kadosh, learned Torah all day, all night. I, I let him learn, I let him this, I let him that, everything is good, and Hashem killed him. No, how do you explain it? So all the Talmud Chachamim didn't have an answer for this poor woman. What are you going to tell her? First of all, she's completely emotional. It doesn't matter what you tell her. You know, if a woman's emotional, there's no sense of talking to her. Well, anyone's emotional, there's no sense of talking to them. You have to wait for them to be less emotional, more rational. If they're emotional, there's no point. That's why also the Chachamim say, if your friend, your friend, not your enemy, if your friend is angry, don't give him any Musa, don't give him any, nothing. Don't talk to him. If he's angry, don't talk to him. Wait for him to not be angry. Why? He's not listening to you anyway. If anything, he's going to do dafka, the opposite of what you tell him. Oh, listen, man, you know, Chill out. It's not worth it. If you hit him, is this? Huh? If I hit him, you know what? I'll hit him, Dafka. He goes and he wasn't gonna hit him before you said it. Before he said it, he was calming down. Now you mention, oh, if you hit him, something's gonna happen. He goes, ah, when we show, I want to prove it to you. Nothing's gonna happen. And he goes and he hits him. Don't say nothing. Quiet. Quiet. Don't say nothing. Why? He's angry. Dangerous. Malach Hamavid is right there. Shemachem. Some of the, the uh, Or Chaim actually says in a different place, <coughs> the one uh, I believe it's Or Chaim, maybe I'm misquoting, but it's definitely in the Torah, that when a person gets angry, starts acting out his anger, some of the Chachamim believe that they replace his soul. They replace his soul, could be a soul of a Rasha enters him. Rasha enters him. His soul, shh, he was Sadiq yesterday, today he's Rasha. Why? He got angry, expressed himself. Shemachem. Very dangerous to be angry. Of course, we all get angry, but expressing it is a different story. So now, this almana, this poor woman, she comes to the Bet Midrash, she tells all of the rabbis over there, Talmidei Chachamim, what, what happens, what's, what's happening in the world here? How is this reward and punishment fair? And the Talmidei Chachamim have, uh, you know, she's emotional, and they really don't know the answer. She goes to another Bet Midrash. She goes to another Bet Midrash. Ah, my husband was a tzaddik. He did this. He did that. No, how come Hashem killed him? Everybody's dumbfounded. What are they going to tell this poor woman? They saw in Shamaim that there has to be an answer given to this woman. Why? It's causing Chilul Hashem. Her question is not just her question. Her question is causing 
a suffix, a doubt in some people. But they hear in the question, like, hey, you know what? She's right. Like somebody said, like, you know, in his mind, he didn't say it out loud. Yes, she's right. I'm going to give a lecture about it. No. He said, you know what? She's right. You know, I remember him. He used to study good. He finished the Shaz, the Yushami, the Bavli, uh, the, the Sifra. He, he, he did, wrote a few books. Tadik. Why should I kill him? In his mind, he was thinking it. In Shemaim, they saw this. They sent Eliyahu and Avi. They sent Eliyahu and Avi, the Gemara says. And she came to the next Bet Midrash. She said the same thing. Ah, oh, my husband, my husband. Eliyahu and Avi said, yes, yes. Your husband died? Yes. Uh, can you uh, tell me when you were Nida? When you were in Nida? Did he touch you? He goes, no, Chas Shalom, he was tzaddik. Never touched me. He says, oh, when you slept, you slept. How did you sleep when you were in Nida? She goes, oh, no. We had a big bed. We had a big bed. And I slept on my side, and he slept on his side. He never touched me. Eliyahu Navi says Bekol Gadol, he says in a loud voice, Baruch Hashem that Hashem killed him. Because he went against Chachamim. He went against the Torah. What did he do? Chachamim, the Torah Hashem, the Torah Kedosha said, don't just not touch her. Don't even come close to her. Not just don't touch her, which is a, <laughs> needless to say. Don't even come closer to her, meaning you're not allowed to even sleep in the same beds. You're not allowed to hand anyone, each other anything. A pillow, a blanket, a spoon, a cup. You're not allowed. He, all the Torah that he learned, he still had the audacity to sleep in the same bed because he's so righteous, he's not going to touch you. Baruch Hashem. <coughs> For Hashem killing him because he was desecrating Hashem's name. So you see, Rabotai, the Isur Nida is not a joke. Every woman and every man needs to know all the details because if you're violating it, it's Isur Karet. It's one of the 36 restrictions in the Torah that a person can lose their Olam Abba. Now, most people think I'm just talking to married folks. Wrong. It's not just married folks. It's single people. Why? If you're touching any woman other than obviously, you know, you know, hold, you know, holding your mom's hand or kissing your mom because you love your mom here and so on, which is allowed. But you're uh, touching a woman that's not your wife. You're not married to her. Even more so, you're intimate, Shem Yachem. You're intimate with a woman that's not your wife. She's Nida. Not only are you wasting seed, but you're going over Isu Nida. Every guy that is intimate before marriage, is going over a sur karet, is making one of the worst crimes in the entire Torah. He thinks, oh, no, no, but I didn't get her pregnant. Isn't that okay? No, it's actually better off if you did. At least it wouldn't be wasting seed. It's still nida, though. You still have a problem on that end. Now, unfortunately, today, most people think that they simply don't teach this stuff, so that's why people don't know. It's not 100% true. They do teach it. They just teach it the wrong way. There are some people that actually teach about Isur Nida, but they teach it, obviously some teach it right. Of course, there's always a uh, need to say that there are some tzaddikim in the world that teach it the right way. But there are some Erev Rav, Reshaim Ahurim, that look more religious than anybody here, that teach the opposite. I actually heard with my own ears a person tell his other people that were so-called students that, uh, listen, you're not allowed to go, if you're single, you're not married, you're not allowed to go with a uh, Jewish girl because she's nida. So, but I know you have uh, tavot, I know you have desires. So just go, go with a goya. Go with a goya, it's practice. So you become a good husband. His keeper was bigger than mine. The Goal Nefesh that's being told Am Yisrael today, the disgusting filth that's being told young kids, old, young, middle, doesn't make a difference, is Mamash, you would think that, how can we survive? The stuff that I heard today from this clown, how can we survive with people like this? He's a rabbi. He's not a, some Amaaret, doesn't know nothing. 
He's a rabbi. He says, rabbi such and such, and so on and so forth. The stuff that's being taught to people is not just the opposite of Torah. It's mamash reshout. It's mamash evil. Ra. The opposite of Torah would be like a, a compliment to it. They teach people mamash to sin. But they give them the idea that they're not sinning, which is worse. No, no. Don't go with a Jewish woman. Go with a non-Jew. Go with a non-Jew. Then that's okay. That's okay then. Or do it in another way. Don't go there. Go in a different way. Mavin Yavin. Go, go in that uh, place. Go in a different place. You don't want to get her pregnant, so don't go over there. Do something else. It's not as bad. There's actually, Rabotai, I'm sorry to tell you, I have to say this stuff. I have to. People need to know. You may know. You may not know. There are people, Baruch Hashem, thousands of people watching this shurim. We need to know why I tell you, you have to cry for Am Yisrael. You have to cry for Am Yisrael. If you don't cry for Am Yisrael, you have no heart. You have to understand what's happening in the world today. There's a whole keilah in Israel. There's a keilah in Israel. They call themselves Orthodox Haridim. Orthodox, Orthodox, Orthodox. But the rabbi and the whole keilah are homosexuals. The rabbi and the entire keilah, it's a keilah for homosexual men. The rabbi has a boyfriend. Every boy, every guy that's a member has a boyfriend. Everybody has a, but the Haridim. Black and white, little penguin, kippah, zakat, everything. But homosexuals. They ask him, hey, listen, uh, buddy, you realize it's in the Torah, it's in a few places, Torah Hashem, Gohan Nefesh, disgusting what you do. He goes, no, no, no. Listen, you have to understand, we don't go all the way. What? What do you mean you don't go all the way? No, and he starts destroying the Torah, and saying over here and over here, just like that Dweck Rasha from England, that Menuval, that said that Yonatan and, and David... It gave us a symbolism that homosexuality is not so bad. Hashem yirachem alenu. And his stupid keila in England is paying him $1.1 million a year to tell them things that are against the Torah. He says that the greatest thing that's happened in recent generations is that homosexuality has become acceptable. A crime against Hashem is acceptable now. Hashem yirachem alenu. Orthodox Rabbi Aldik. There's a keilah. This rasha gives power to other rashaim, an orthodox rabbi of homosexuals. Anytime I talked about homosexuals in the past, I said, oh, listen, the leading rabbi of the conservative movement in Israel, in Jerusalem, he's homosexual. He's openly homosexual. Leading rabbi of conservative, he himself is openly homosexual, proud of it, marches, but he's conservative. It's a different religion. The reform, I don't know what, what you call them. I don't even know if you call them uh, humans. They give the dog aliyah. They give people aliyah. The, the, the rabbi is a woman. That's a nana jew bechlal. It's not, it's not even a different religion. I don't know what it is. Conservative was like until 67 years ago was actually similar to modern orthodox today. So there was still something in there. Now it's there becoming reform. But now Rabbi Karim, the orthodox world, the Orthodox world is not so Orthodox. Why? Kedusha. Our Kedusha is unfortunately failing miserably. People that cannot overcome their desires, just like Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev, Allah Shalom used to say, and said in Lekutem Maharan, a person that's a gaftan, that's a prideful person, will waste seed. Waste seed. That wasting seed, that desire, that addiction to wasting seed will lead him to become promiscuous if he has the ability. That promiscuity, if he has the ability, someone who tries to become impure, Hashem opens the door for him, helps him to become impure. You want to sin? I'll help you sin. You want to do mitzvot? I'll help you do mitzvot. Whatever you want, I'll help you. Someone who tries to make sins, you waste seed? Oh, that's not enough. You want to go with girls too? Uh, married women, non-married women, goyot, judo, whatever. No problem. I'll help you with that too. I'll, I'll open, I'll make the genom deeper for you. We say it in Shabbat. We say it in Tefillah and Mincha. We say it in, uh, uh, in, in, in Shalom Aleichem. 
Shalom Aleichem, we talk about the depthness of Geinom. People say, no, no, there's no Geinom in the Torah. What do you mean? Every single page in your Siddur mentions Geinom. I'm exaggerating. Every other page. Every other page in the, in the in Sidu, Sidu, anyone who knows how to read Hebrew. Every other page in the Sidu mentions Geinom. Shalom Aleichem, the favorite song for every single person that's not even Jewish, Bechlal, mentions Geinom. No, no, there's no gain. What is no gain? So what is what is there's a mistake here? Lost in translation. Abutai, someone that we see the Shem says not enough. Okay, I'll get I'll let you I'll let you be promiscuous too. Women, oh, eventually it's not enough. Eventually it's not enough. He goes with men too. That's what Rabbi Nachman Baslav says. Rabbi Nachman Baslav says he starts with Gava. Gava leads to wasting seed. Wasting seed leads to promiscuity. Promiscuity leads to homosexuality. If that's not enough, he starts going with animals, bestiality. And you think, yeah, Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman, he's a tzaddik, but I think over here he uh, went too far. I think he went too far, Rabbi Nachman. Well, sadly, I saw a report with my own eyes. Right now, in America, we're not talking about the whole world. America alone, 400 million people approximately, give or take a few Hashayim. 400 million people. Three million of them registered themselves, admitted themselves that they, on a regular basis, are with animals. Three million. You're talking about nearly 1% of the population admitted to being with animals. There's actually a hotel. There's a hotel in Las Vegas that just some years ago, maybe five, six years ago, was raided, but I'm sure it was reopened that specialized catering to people that like animals. You want a sheep, you want a donkey, you want whatever you want. We got it. People, no, no, people, it's a different place. That's, uh, that's easy. We provide animals. Rabotai Karim, the situation is horrible. Why? There's no Yesod, there's no Kedusha. People think, no, what's the big deal? Okay, so he makes this one little sin. No, it's not a one little sin. It's not a one little sin. It's not a one little sin. It's a big thing. It leads to a lot of horrible things. I'm sure all of the haters are going to try to tear me apart, saying, oh, this guy is great. Go check all the facts. Check all the facts. We'll check also what the Or Chaim HaKadosh said as well. Or Chaim HaKadosh says in Parashat Tezriya, Isha ki Tezriya, Zecher. says when a woman conceives and gave birth. So the Oral Chaim HaKadosh says, why does it say Ve'yalda Zachar? Meaning the verb to describe that she gave birth is she gave birth in the past, not Ve'yoledet, she's going to give birth or she's giving birth. It should be the same word, but used in a different way. You led it, not yalda. Yalda means it's past tense. Why does it say yalda? Yalda, it's she already did it. No, but it's not. She didn't already did it. You're saying she's about to do it, or she's doing it now. Why are you using a word that says she did it already? So the Oral Chaim HaKadosh Mechades gives a phenomenal, phenomenal chidush here to explain what does it mean to be a Ish Kadosh? What does it mean to be a Isha Kedoshah? It says he's trying to say here is because the word Vyalda is used instead of Vyoledet as an active verb because the actual conception of the child is not done at the time she gives birth. The birth is not being, it's not, that's not the actual when the child's coming to the world. When is the child coming to the world? Oh, Chaim Kadosh says, at the moment the father and the mother are actually intimate. That moment that the zera, that the seed, leaves the man's body and enters the woman, that's when Hashem decides what kind of neshama I'm going to give this person. The Gemara Masechet Nida says there's a malach named Laila. And I've told you this before, but it always needs to be repeated. This Laila has a job. What's his job, this Laila? Takes the seed, brings it to Hashem Barach, 
It says, Akadosh Baruch Hu. I have in my hand a seed. A neshama. Which one should I give these two? Which neshama should I put into this, into this seed? Is it going to live or is it going to die? Is it going to be a zakhar or nekeva, man or woman? Is this man or woman going to be rich or poor? Is this man or woman going to be wise or fool? Tzaddik Rasha. What can I do with this, Hashem? And Hashem Midbarach decides on every single one of them. This is what you put into the zera. Now how can we influence this? What can we do about it? Oh, you keep Shabbat. A lot of people keep Shabbat, but they have kids that are reshaim. <laughs> Wicked kids convert to Christianity, go with married women, steal, rob, not even good in a, by anybody's definition. How could it be? They keep Shabbat, no? Oh, Chaim HaKadosh says this. He says, Rabotai, it's decided what kind of neshama is in the child based on two things. One, what is in the father and the mother's mind at that moment? What are they thinking about? Is he thinking about his secretary or he's thinking about his wife? Is he thinking about some woman he saw on a screen somewhere or he's thinking about his wife? Is he thinking about the maid or he's thinking about, who's he thinking about? Needless to say, who is she thinking about? Is she thinking about the clerk at the coffee shop, at the supermarket, her boss? Who is she thinking about? Her high school sweetheart? Who is she thinking about? Oh, no, they've already done tshuva. They love each other. They only think about each other. Oh, they only think about each other? Baruch Hashem, past test number one. This one we already told you. No chidush here. But don't Chaim HaKadosh didn't finish. He said there's a second issue. The second issue of how does Hashem decide Bekdushato, what kind of neshama am I going to put in this seed? It's based on what is in the mind of other people about the father and the mother at that moment. Not the father and the mother. Other people, what do they think about you? They think, oh, the father... Rasha Ganav, he stole everybody, he stole money from everybody, he borrows money, doesn't return it, he does this, he does that. What do you think, going to bring Moshe Rabbeinu? But he's a tzaddik, he doesn't do nothing, he works, he cleans bathrooms, he's a blue collar guy, everything is good. His wife, she has nice kisui losh, everything is good. But the, 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 the wig, the wig only for, for birthday parties, and, 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 and you know, she doesn't wear the wig all the time. She only wears it for birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, weddings, when everybody can see her. When just Mustafa and Steve and everybody else sees her, she's wearing a kisurosh. The whole year she's wearing a kisurosh, nice scarf, everything. Only three pounds of makeup. But the wig that's two feet long, she only wears for the parties. Tzadika, no? Is it tzadika? Is it not lying? What tzadika? It's actually worse that way. Tchilul Hashem. Aside from the issues of immodesty and Abu Dazara and so on, which we'll get into momentarily. Oh, so you're religious the whole year round except when everybody can see you. Except when the neighbors are all coming and the friends and the family, everybody's coming, you wear that nice long wig. That's okay then. How come you don't wear it the whole year? Because you know there's something wrong. Oh, but you're allowed to like shut off Hashem for a day, for a night. So what's going to happen to this dear woman? Well, dear woman, I know you're trying. And I know the mitzvah of Kisurosh in this generation is no different than Akedat Yitzchak. It's very difficult for women because women live for attention. Most of the time it's because their husbands don't give them enough. It's actually partly their husband's fault. Any woman that gets enough attention and love from a husband has no desire whatsoever to be immodest. Why? She already gets more than enough attention from her husband. The women that look for attention from other people, simply it's because their husbands don't give them enough. Usually. Sometimes it's because there's something wrong with them. But most of the time it's because of their husbands. 
Now this dear woman that has a very, very difficult time putting on the kisuros, the simple mitpachat, the black, the white, the navy blue, the green mitpachat, even if she could put a few diamonds on it and nice things on it, she feels bad showing up to a wedding with this mitpachat. Why? She feels like she's going to stand out. She feels like she's going to stand out because all of the other frum, rebitsins in the, in, the, in the show, in the... In the, in the, the uh, Shem uh, wedding over here. All of them have what? They have the tight clothes to make sure that everybody can tell exactly what their figure looks like. Even without them taking them off. And on top of that, they want to make sure you have a nice wig so that she looks like she just left the salon. She left the runway after, you know, the salon was for the runway. And you see not even a single gray hair, not even a single, nothing wrong with it. It's like Mamash Gan Eden hair. Never frizzy, never messed up, nothing ever wrong with it. We're not even mentioning the Abu Dazara yet. We're just mentioning the issues of this. And this wig, it can't be up to here. Because, ah, of course, she looks like a boy. She, well, I'm already going to wear a wig. You can't look like a boy. I got to look like a nice, uh, you know, woman from the television. So you got to make it extra long. That even the Ashkenazi poskim that allowed wigs didn't allow long wigs. Nobody ever allowed long wigs. Nobody ever allowed these wigs that look like real hair. No one in the history of Poskim, of Am Yisrael, no one ever allowed it. You can say any, any name you want. The Lebe Abit Rebbe never allowed long wigs. But no, she's saying, no, if he allowed wigs, then uh, it's modernizing with the time. It's allowed. Bedir v'yavo. And she's wearing this nice long wig to the wedding, to the bar mitzvah. It's her son. It's her brother getting married. She's part of the Simcha. She's part of the Simcha. Everything is nice, right? The wig is such good quality, no one knows it's a wig. Unless she's wearing a wig, unless it's another woman. But all the guys, like, wow, sh- she looks good with no wig. She could, looks good with no Kisui Rosh. No one thinks it's a wig. It's, it's such a nice, the, the look looks so good. She looks like she came out of Gan Eden with this wig. Now, what's the problem with this? Because there was a certain guy that calls himself a rabbi, says that you're supposed to express your beauty. If the world doesn't see your beauty, it's not worth it. What's the problem with this? The problem is, Rabotai, is that this woman is going to look very, very good. She's going to look very, very pretty. But very, very good and very, very pretty to the wrong set of eyes. The eyes that do not belong to her husband. The eyes that belong to the waiter. The eyes that belong to the busboy. The eyes that belong to the groom. The eyes that belong to everybody else aside from her husband. Most likely not even her husband. Why? Because her husband is busy looking at all the other women. He's not, no, I'm not looking at other women, honey. I'm just comparing how much your wig looks better than hers. Damn, I'm complimenting your wigs by looking at other women. I'm not looking at other women. Chas shalom. Come on, uh, honey, I love you. I'm just looking at her wig. You see her wig? It's a little reddish on the right side. You see that? Yeah, it doesn't look like yours. It doesn't look like yours. I'm, yours much better, honey, much better. So why are you looking at the other? No, I'm not looking. I'm looking at the one behind her. No, no, it's, I was thinking about your wig when I was looking at the other. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't. Honey, I love you. Give me another piece of cake. Give me a piece of cake. Wait, he wants to put more cake in his mouth. She doesn't have to talk. <laughs> now this woman is going to have every party she goes to, wedding, bar mitzvah, simcha, she thinks she's doing a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to make the bride and groom happy, right? Problem is she just brought a tragedy to our home. What tragedy? The tragedy is that someone is going to set his filthy eyes on her and he's going to think about her. When? Whenever he wants. Once you see a woman, that mind gets imprinted. That, that visual gets imprinted, engraved into that person's brain. And you only think of it at the most inappropriate moments. So now one of those moments could be when she is trying to do something holy by bringing a child to the world, 
bringing a holy little tzaddik child, little tzaddika to the world, bringing Sarai Menu to the world, bringing Mashiach Tzitkenu to the world. So the Malach Laila goes up to Shamaim and says, Hashem Yidbarach, you know everything of what they're thinking, but also what everybody else is thinking about them. What will be with this seed, Hashem? And Hashem Yidbarach has to cry tears that cause tsunamis to say, really, I wanted to give them the next Gdola Do. Really, I wanted to give her such a tzaddika, she was going to give birth to the Mashiach himself. But because she wants to wear a nice wig only once a year, to the wedding and to the bar mitzvah and to all the other things, but the once a year also has people that have eyes and don't know how to watch their breath. And they saw her hair that's fake but real in their eyes. And they visualized her hair and the rest of it when they were doing other things. And they're thinking about her right now. Right now they're thinking about her with their filthy, disgusting thoughts. So I cannot bring the Mashiach through her. I cannot bring a tzaddik through her. I have to bring a rasha for her. Is it worth it? Is it so worth it to wear it? Is it so worth it to wear it to look like the sota? Doesn't anybody actually think about this? You think about Sarai Menu. What does Hashem say? Oh, she's so modest. You think about Leah. She covered herself. She saw her husband. She covered herself. Rachel. Rivka, Tzadikot, Kedoshot, Chana, Kedosha, all of them. One woman in the entire Torah, her hair is mentioned. Who? The wayward woman, the Sota. The Sota, her hair is mentioned. Why? They're suspecting she cheated on her husband. Only one woman in the entire Torah, they talk about her hair. Who? The one that they suspect she cheated on her husband with a guy. Arav Shbadron, Alava Shalom, screamed out with tears. Mamash, I heard it myself. Screamed out with tears. I was surprised it didn't cause an earthquake. Maybe it did. I don't know. Something happened in the world when he cried. He says, why does a Bat Israel want to look like the Sota? Why? Why do you want to look like the Sota? Why? Why can't you look like Sarai Menu? Why can't you look like Chana? Why can't you look like somebody in a Torah that's righteous? Why the Sota? But this is not enough. Why? Because everyone's going to say, no, but my, my rabbi allows it. My rabbi allows it. The Erev Rav allows it. No, no, no. The rabbi that allowed it didn't allow the long wig. He allowed something that was a wig, but was obviously a wig. The real righteous poskim, the Ashkenazi poskim that allowed it, didn't allow the long wig that you can't tell if it's real or it's not, and it's really real. He never allowed that. No one ever allowed these wigs of today. But needless to say, no one ever in the history of Am Israel ever allowed Avodah Zarah to enter our homes. No one. And this, Rabotai, is the point we've discovered, is the point we've discussed, is the point we've mamash bled over, over the last few years to bring light to over across the globe. To the extent that there was a book published about it, Baruch Hashem, with a couple of hundred pages providing proof that the vast majority of the wigs in the world are coming from idolatry. For the simple economic, the simple financial reason that free is always going to be a better price than any other price. Free and abundant, that's the market. So even if you say that your wig maker is bringing it from Brazil or from Zimbabwe or from uh, Morocco or from England or Italy or wherever you want to say they're bringing it from, they're not. Why are they not? Because they're not going to go pay for something you can get for free. They're not. I said, no, no, but she's paying for it whether she's getting it from uh, India or she's getting it from anywhere else. 
Yes, she's paying for it, but the supplier, the supplier is not going to go to Cambodia and pay some poor people a few shekels to get their hair if he could simply get it for free, meaning close to free because somebody has to sell it. The original temple gets it for free, and he has millions of people willing to give him more for free. And not only that, even if you got, let's say some people say, no, no, they came from Cambodia. They came from uh, other places, Brazil. Even if every single person in Cambodia shaved their head tomorrow, everybody shaved their head, that's 17 million people. Even if every Brazilian shaved their head tomorrow, everyone, men, women, child, include dogs if you want, every one of them shaved their head. The combined of both countries would supply the market for maybe two and a half years, period. Both countries, you shaved everyone's head, not if they, against their will. Because you're never going to see a Brazilian ever shaving their head for money. They'd rather kill themselves. That's what they told me themselves. You're never going to see that. But let's say you did it against their will, like they do it in the uh, uh, Russian jails. The Russian women jails, they go to the Russian women jails, they shave their head against their will. But let's say you got all of them. You got Cambodia and Brazil. And you got to shave all their heads. You supplied the market for two and a half years, but you killed the market for the next 10 to 15 years. Why? Because that's how long it takes to grow the hair to the same length as it is right now. So that means you still have to go back to India. Why? Because India has between 25 and 50 million people a year donating their hair for free. You're never going to be able to compete with that. Aside from that, it's not she shaves her head and her head goes to another woman's hair. It doesn't work that way. She shaves her head and her hair goes to a plant. The average wig is comprised of three women's heads because they have to measure the size. They can't be just, you know, it doesn't go from her hair where she has split ends, she has uh, long hair, short hair, and no, it all has to be a certain length. It goes to a factory, meaning in order for the kosher certificate, that they, they, they fraud that they have to be really kosher, the rabbis have to watch the entire process, which is a su, by the way. You're not allowed to look at these women. So I don't know how you could even kosher it, even if you wanted to. Can't look at these women being shaven. You have to, though. Why? You have to see them being shaven. From the second they're being shaven, all three women, because you have to see, and they're doing it all for just they don't like their hair. Not because it's Abu Dazara. From the minute all three of them shave their head until the minute goes through the process, cleans from the lice, cleans from all the disgusting stuff, painted, whatever you want to do, all the process that goes through it, different factories, India, China, different processing plants all over the world. You have to follow the hair everywhere, just this little bunch. All the way until it's made into a wig, and then it's remarketed, rebranded, relabeled. Fast forward six and a half months. All the way until it arrives at Mrs. Goldstein's head. Good luck with that. Why? It's not possible. Because it's not economically viable for anyone to take three heads and just allow you to follow the process with three heads. If you look at any of the pictures in the book or the ones that we've published, you see that when they take hair from people, they take entire fields, the size of football fields, full of hair. You don't know who came from her or her. You don't know where it is. It's a bunch of hair. It's a field like you have a field of grass, a field of corn, a field of other stuff. You have a field of hair. And all of the hair goes in huge bunches into plants to clean it, to do, to do this, to do that. It's impossible to follow a single strand of hair. Impossible. Therefore, it's impossible to know if and what the intentions of the person was and the reality is when you have 1.3 billion people in the world call themselves Indians that the vast majority of them serve their idols through giving their hair you cannot compete with such a market not from Brazil not from uh, you know uh, Cambodia not even from China that take from dead people which is also not allowed not from Russia that take it from people from jails which, by the way, is also not allowed, not from any of these things. A woman that, t- that has real hair on her head, that's a wig, has a very serious problem. Why? She has avodah zarah on her head. 
you want to take the chance with your ulama ba, be my guest. I just provide information. I have nothing against women that have wigs. I have nothing against the wigs themselves. I have nothing against the Indian people. I have nothing against the, uh, anybody. I have something against what people have against the shem. That's all I care about. Hashem, that's all I care about. I'm providing information. You want to put your Olam Abba on the line for it because you like your wig more than Olam Abba? Fine, be my guest. It doesn't change my life. I provided you the information. And that's what people can't get their head around. They can't get their head around. No, no, but it's really hard. What do you mean it's really hard? What do you mean it's really hard? You really like that people look at you that much more than Olam Abba? Like, do you realize the whole thing is on the line? Like, the whole thing. It's not like a small mitzvah, like you forgot to do something that's a rabbinical mitzvah. Not to make any mitzvah small, but to give you some type of illustration that you have. You forgot to wash your hands in the morning. It's a big mitzvah. We can't really measure mitzvot. But you can't compare the isu, the, 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 the sin, and uh, you know, the, the problems that will happen to somebody that doesn't wash their hands in the morning versus somebody that has Abu Dazara on their head or even in their house. You can't compare the two. Needless to say that Chazal explained to us anything that you make an adon on you, that makes you make it like a master on you, like it's significant to you, not just people, is taken from Adon Olam. If the wig is really, really important to you. That means Hashem is a little less important to you. Yeah, but she's a Rebbitzin. Okay, she's a Rebbitzin. We're a little bit less connection to Hashem. Let it be a Rebbitzin. Yeah, but he's a rabbi. He's only using it to, uh, to make his beard a little longer. Fake beard. No, but man, there's really fake beards. I don't know why people buy it, but there's fake beards. You guys are laughing. People actually buy fake beards. It's a whole market. It's a whole industry. They buy fake beards. I don't know, maybe they, 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 they had some disease. I don't know what the reason why people buy this stuff. But there's, fa- there's a fake be- beard industry. Oh, no, he just really wants to look more righteous to his keila because, you know, long beard makes you look righteous. Okay, so, he's, you know, his beard is more important than God, just a little bit more important. Rabotai, we provide information because we care. We provide information because Chachmenu Zichonam Livracha told us that if we skip it, if we care less about it, bad things can happen. But not just bad things to our Olam Abba Chas V'Shalom, Lo Alenu Lo Alechem, but a bad Olam, a Zeh, for our kids. Because we decided to go to our Bar Mitzvah with a really long and immodest wig, and people looked at us, and they liked the way our, the shape of our face matched the wig. And it was a this color and a that color and a this shape and a that shape. And they had that in mind at the moment you were trying to bring the Mashiach to the world. And Hashem has to decide, I'm sorry, I cannot, not only I can't bring the Mashiach to the world, I can't even bring a rabbi to the world. I can't even bring a Yeresh to the world. Where do we see proofs of this? Chizkiyahu HaMelech was so holy that the Gemara says that if the Mashiach was going to be brought into the world at that moment, Hashem already decided it would be Chizkiyahu. In fact, Hashem decided, I want to bring Mashiach and let's make it Chizkiyahu. Malach HaMavet came to him, Hashem, Hashem. If you didn't bring Mashiach at the time of David, who used to sing to you, how can you bring Mashiach and make Chizkiyahu with the Mashiach? He doesn't sing to you. Hashem says, you're right. I can't bring Mashiach to Chizkiyahu. But Chizkiyahu had a problem. What was the problem? He saw through prophecy that if he has children, those kids are going to be Rashaim. So he didn't want to bring kids. So the prophet came to him and said, tomorrow you're going to die. Why am I going to die? I'm tzaddik. Everybody learned Torah because of me. Six-year-old kids know the entire Mishnah in his generation. Six-year-old kids knew the entire oral Torah by heart. He put a sword on the ground. He says, whoever doesn't learn Torah is going to get the sword instead. He didn't say you should come to the shul, try to be on time. No. 
He said, either you come and you learn Torah day and night, or you get the sword instead. I think I'm going to try it next week. I just have to find a sword. But now, Rabotai, oh, maybe I'll bring like a plastic knife to show, show you guys some intimidation. Now, Rabotai Karim, Chizkiyahu Melech made the entire generation do tshuva. Everybody learned Torah. But he was scared. Why? He saw two prophecy. I'm going to have Rashaim kids. I don't want to bring Rashaim kids go against Hashem. So he said to the prophet Isaiah, listen, I don't want to die. I'll do what Hashem says. I'll bring kids to the world, but uh, I have to have protection. What? Let me marry your daughter. Your daughter is Tzadika. You're a prophet. Kodesh Kodeshim. I'm trying to be holy. Baruch Hashem. Uh, Hashem likes me. Okay, so if your daughter is holy, I'm holy. Bezad Hashem, we're going to do good. We're increasing our chances of success, right? Imagine. Your daughter wants to marry Arab Ovadia. Your daughter wants to marry the next Mashiach. I mean, that's as great as it gets. Your son wants to marry Sarai Menu. It's like, hey, where do I write the check to? I'll borrow money. I'll do whatever I can. Let's get married immediately. Now, don't even wait for, for anything. I'm out right now. It's Sarai Menu. Not right now. So they get married. And they have two kids. And the two kids are named Menashe and Rav Shakeh. And it says in the Torah that Chizkiyahu was in the Bet Midrash and he heard his two sons saying, look at our father's bald head. It's a perfect place to worship an idol. The other one's to bring a korban, to bring a korban and lay it on our father's bald head. The other one says to him, no, not just a korban, we could kill, we can murder, we can do a lot of Abu Dazara, all types of things on his head too. Chizkiyahu Melech has two sons, Reshaim Gmurim, they're little kids. So Torah asks, how could it be Chizkiyahu, the daughter of Ishaya, the Isaiah, holy of holies, how could such holy people bring Reshaim Gmurim when they're little kids, they're not even adults yet. Or Chaim HaKadosh says something scary. He says that at the moment that they conceived, that Chizkiyahu and his wife conceived, his wife, Tzadika wife, Kodesh Kodeshim wife, mistakenly, mistakenly thought of what? What she saw on the way to the room. What did she see on the way to the room? She saw one of the servants, one of the servants of one of the famous idolaters. She saw one of the servants that was there and she thought of him, the, mo- the, the, the thought of him stuck in her mind. The thought of this Rasha Arul, disgusting, filthy human being, stuck in her mind when, at that moment. She thought of an idolater at that moment. Two idolaters came to the world. But she was holy. Perfect. She passed, uh, you know, A, check mark. B, X. She thought about it. Everything's good. A is good. B is no good. B is no good. Rabotai, we see this across our Torah that Gdolim fell. When the uh, daughter of uh, Ishaya thought about one of the servants of Moradach Baladan. Further, there's a book called Olamot Shel Toar. Olamot Shel Toar is a book that full of real stories, real life stories. And Chizuk uh, for the issues of modesty. And there's a story, a real-life story from an older woman that brought this to light to her own family when she realized it herself. She was, as frum as can be, married to a Talmid Chacham. She had, Baruch Hashem, children, life, a lot of Torah in her life, ten kids. All ten kids 
came from a holy marriage, no nida, no nothing, everything is good. Nine out of the ten kids all became good people. Rabbis, Tamidei Chachamim, Yehudiot Kedoshot, one's better than the next. But one kid, Rasha, one kid, wicked as wicked can be. Kofer Gamur, heretic, hates the Torah, and no matter how many prayers and zgulot they would do for him, no matter how many things they would try and say to him, excuse me, no matter what they did, nothing worked. It was mamash as if there was like a wall between him and Hashem, Hashem and Hashem. They talked to him, showed him proofs, showed him this, showed him that, talked to him this way, talked to him that way, tried to help. Nothing will help this guy. He kept getting worse and worse. Mamash Rasha Meusha. Until later in our day, she finally realized the token came. I get Besiat Bishmaya. Hashem gave her this. Why? To publicize the story. She says that before they conceived this child, they went to a. Um, a tzad, what's a tzad? How do you say tzad? Like one of those, uh, um, you know, they have a uh, people walk, you know, on the streets. A lot of people. What is it called? Tzad, I mean, tzad, you know, where they have a, uh, you know, they have it for uh, the Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Is a lot parade, parade. There you go, Shechem. parade. So they had a march for Yom Ha'atzma'ut. They had a march, a parade for Yom Ha'atzma'ut, the uh, Israeli Independence Day, where the Israeli government likes to highlight their army, their power, their weapons, and all that stuff, which, by the way, is a bad idea, but that's a different story. And she says herself that during this march, she saw a very handsome general, young man, muscular, beautiful face, and she said to herself, Be'ezrat Hashem, I'll have a child just like him. Be'ezrat Hashem, I'll have the child just like him. And she did. With all of his midot mushchatot, heretical teachings, heretical upbringings, and kochi ve'otzem yadi mentality, my power, my strength, I did everything. And she says, this is what I have. I wanted this person, my son. He's good looking, he's must everything. But he also has the Zionist criminal mentality, communist mentality that uh, we don't want. When did she have this in mind? She had it in mind when she was conceiving the child with her husband. There's something called Gamma Brit, which we all know is wasting seed. But there's also something called Pgam Amachshava. Damaged thought. And a damaged thought, as we've already discovered here, can lead to a damaged son, a damaged daughter. Pgam Amachshava leads to Pgam Neshama, leads to a defective Neshama of a kid. You're bringing in the world, into the world another kid. This kid, me skin, the poor kid, has no interest in Torah. Has difficulty learning it. Has difficulty putting on modest clothes. Has difficulty not overcoming his desires. You see, certain people have these major, major difficulties. And then the parents come to you and say, what should I do with this kid? He's causing trouble. He's causing this. What you should do, you should do tshuva. That's what you should do. You did it. You're at fault. It's not the kid's fault. It's your fault. Don't cry to Hashem that he gave you this kid. You did it because you have a filthy mind. But people don't like to hear this stuff. But it's true. The fact that we don't like to hear it doesn't change the truth. Our thoughts are what's going to lead to action. 
And unfortunately, when we don't watch our thoughts and we edu- educate our kids with things that are against the Torah, we educate ourselves with things that are against the Torah, only damage can happen from that. Nothing good will ever come out out of your kid going to public school. Nothing good will ever come out out of a kid going to learn heretical teachings. Nothing good will ever happen about your kid fitting in with the public. Nothing good will ever happen. But unfortunately, many people don't like to hear this and they don't like to follow it either. And they send their kids to so-called religious schools that are not religious at all. They have boys and girls, 10, 15 years old, in the same school, which all of the Chachamim said it's forbidden. You're not allowed to have teenagers in the same school. There's no reason whatsoever why anyone should think that it's allowed to have teenage kids of opposite gender in the same school because the kid already has a problem with protecting his weight as it is. Now you're going to have his girlfriend attend the school too. It's surprising there's no more, there's not more uh, pregnancy cases in his yeshivot. You see, many of these so-called yeshivas of the Western world are not very different than the public schools that I went to as a kid. But I went there because we didn't, don't, we didn't know anything. What's their excuse? If they call themselves religious. Can't find a normal school. In many places, many towns, you can't find a normal school that has, you know, kids separated. Went to different places around the world, different places. I go to school sometimes to give lectures. You see, Mama, the kids wearing kippah, the girls are wearing a skirt. As soon as the shoe is finished, right after the shoe is finished, the guy is hugging the girl. Hey, yeah, honey, yeah, hey. And the teachers are all okay with it. Why? They see it all the time. Right outside of my shield, there was kids, a group of boys and girls, hugging and kissing each other. In the school. They're not hiding it. Because they don't think there's anything wrong with it. Why? Because their parents sent them there. Arav Ovadia, Allah wa shalom. Many people knew he was G'dol Adol. Many people knew he was a giant Chacham, Posek Adol, one of the giants of giants. But very few know how much of an Ish Emet he was until they read his work. Of about 40 years ago, there was a big Ason. There was a big tragedy where a school bus of children, right before the age of Bar Mitzvah, about 12 years old, 12 and a half years old, and some close to 13, babies before Bar Mitzvah, a school bus full of them got into an accident, hit a train, killing 20 kids. This was a tragedy that the state of Israel has never seen. Many people cried, many people mourned, many people thought that this is too much. But Rav Avadi Alav Shalom wrote a letter, wrote a letter about this, and I'm not going to read the whole letter because it'll take too much time. But I'll give you some taste of what he says. Anyone that wants the copy of the letter, I can text it to you. He says, "This school, this school that you know, every this tragedy happened." Ki yesod kol kiyumenu u achinuch leTorah veliirat shemaim. Our entire existence as a nation is standing on, is depending on education of Torah and Yirat Shemaim. Moray v'rabotai, bet asefer bet barnar, ha-miyusad al chinu chiloni v'kafrani, zizea et kol ha-medina ba-asun shekara lo, v'are en davar ba-olam shu mikre chas v'shalom. It says, Rabotai, the school Bet Barnal, whose foundation is education of secular and heretical education, shook up the country with this tragedy. But as we all know, there's no such thing as coincidence, chas v'shalom. To say something is a coincidence is heretical. He says, he mentions a Rambam that says that anyone 
that sees that there's a tragedy, the tragedy is coming from heaven. Why? At that time that there's a tragedy, there's going to be a big scream, a big uproar, that we are supposed to know that this is because of our evil actions. It's not because Hashem is making a mistake. The point of tragedies happening in the world, little kids dying, adults dying, fires, cancer, all of these things, the Rambam says, Rav Avadi repeats, this is to shake us up so we cry about our evil actions that caused it. Not to cry, oh Hashem, why'd you do this? What do you mean, why'd you do this? It's because of you. You did it. Action, reaction. Don't cry to me if you did it. It's like somebody killed his wife and says, oh, I can't believe Hashem took her life. What do you mean? You shot her. You pulled the trigger. Oh, I can't. What do you mean you can't believe? Don't pull the trigger then. And he continues, I'm skipping around a little bit. It says, He mentions a, a, a verse in a Torah in Exodus. That's actually coming in next in the uh, this week's parasha, chapter twenty-two. I'm sorry, two weeks ago, two weeks from now. Chapter twenty-two, verse number five. Parashat Mishpatim. It says, "Ki tetzeish umatzakotzim v'neichal gadish." It's a verse that says, "If a fire shall go forth and find thorns." And a stack of grains or a standing crop or a field is consumed. It says this verse, and uh, someone who kindled the fire shall make restitution. He says, but this ish, this, this fire that consumed thorns and, uh, and crop, is giving us an insight of what's going on. He says these kotzim, these thorns, are the teacher's the morim morot, the teachers, the male and female teachers of the school, who are mechale Shabbat and kufrim, that are mechale Shabbat, violate Shabbat, and are heretics. But what ended up happening is that the Gadish, aval nechal Gadish elu, elu yaladim sheyadayim lo yigiu lemitzvot, says, but what ended up happening, because of these thorns, the crop was consumed. The crop is the children that were consumed because of these kotzim, because of these thorns. These children that haven't gotten to an age of mitzvot, they haven't even reached the age of 13 for males and 12 for females. Alma asa Hashem kacha. Why did Hashem do such a thing? Al bitul Torah shel bet, shel, tinokot shel bet rabban. On us not educating our children, we're obligated to teach our children, and when we teach them heretical teachings, we're violating this mitzvah. Kula mitchamkim al sibat ha'ason akaved v'anoraze. Everybody is trying to escape and dodge the reason behind this tragedy. All these people that are speaking, there's no truth in what they're saying. There's nothing real what's coming out of them. He says, why does all this happen? Why are we escaping? Let's look at, he's look, let's look at the reality. The head of the, uh, the, I guess the mayor of Petah Tikva, of this place that this happened to, he opened a uh, places that are open on Shabbat, violate Shabbat, went against the rabbis, went against the rabbis of the city, arrested people that uh, made uh, all types of protests against the Chilul Shabbat, hired evil cops to beat them up. Rosh Ha'ir Shel Ashkelon Eli Dayan, this uh, head of the city, Eli Dayan of Ashkelon, 
שמתיימר להיות דתי, that pretends like he's religious, פתח בריכה מעורבת לאנשים ונשים יחדיו, וציווייה גם לפעילה בשבת. This guy that pretends to be religious opened a public pool for men and women to swim in and even do it on Shabbat. I tried to send him a letter to give him some Musar Eskel in a nice way, but he did not even return, have the, uh, the, the, the nerve to return a, uh, any, any reply to me at all. And this is a guy, This is a person that calls themselves religious. And what can you expect? What can you expect from wayward teachers? Zoi Petach Tikva. This is Petach Tikva. This is what happened. Zoi Petach Tikva she pirsema bechulei Shabbat im Rosh Ha'ir Dov Chibori Shem Reshaim Yerkav. He says this is Petach Tikva that publicized things about violating Shabbat under the name of the uh, mayor Dov Chibori Shem Reshaim Yerkav. He's cursing him in the letter, and so on and so forth. He says why is all of this happening? Why is all these tragedies happening to Am Yisrael? En ke milyon yeladim be medinat Yisrael shalomdim be bete sefer chilonim enam omrim vegam enam yodim afilu pasuk shma Yisrael oi lanu shekach alta biyamenu He says, we have a million kids that study in these secular schools who do not even know and do not even know the existence and don't even know how to say a single verse of the Torah, including Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Woe to us that this is happening in our days, in our generation. Rabotai Karim, this was the Gedol Ador. This is the Gedol Ador. This is one of the giants. A person that does not rebuke, does not believe in the Torah. Why? You have to fulfill the Torah. You have to rebuke. There are places that you have to rebuke. You have to tell people the truth. The truth can sometimes hurt. The truth can sometimes even test you yourself. Which leads me to the next story that shook me up when I heard it. But also shows us about the authenticity of our Torah and our sages. May their memory be blessed. The Ramban, Alava Shalom, wrote explicitly that it's impossible that if a husband and a wife act in Kedusha, act with Kedusha when they're bringing a child to the world in their intimacy, it is impossible that the child will be wicked. If they're holy during their time of intimacy, it is impossible that that kid will actually be wicked. This is what he wrote. And as you would know it, in his ma'ala, in his daga, and he fought against Christianity, he won a debate of all debates that no one ever needs to debate Christianity ever again. All you need to do is read the book, see all the questions that the Christians can never answer. But one of his kids, the Ramban, one of his own kids converted to Christianity. So the king of that time, the great king of the time, like the Ramban, he says, he called him into his uh, kingdom. He said, hey, I saw you wrote this, that it's impossible for a wicked child to come to a Kedusha, and uh, hey, uh, your kid, last I checked, he just converted to the Christians. Why, were you and the Rabbani thinking uh, some stuff? And the Ramban didn't have an answer. Because he knew he didn't think about it. And he couldn't say that his wife thought about such a thing. But he didn't have an answer. And he left the kingdom sad and upset, thinking, what could it be? How could it be? Hashem Yerachem, did I make a, did I write something that's not Torah? What happened? Who, what, when? He arrives at home and the Rabbanit sees her husband the living Sefer Torah, upset. 
unlike, unlike a Ish Kadosh, doesn't get upset. The Torah brings joy to the world. Yes, there are ups and downs in the world, but for Ish Emet, for a person that has Torah, does it affect them the same way? They know everything is from Hashem. But she sees her husband, the Ramban, sees him sad. He says, my dear husband, what happened? And he tells her what happened. He says, I wrote in the book that it's impossible for a wicked child to come from Maaseh Kadosh, when there's Kedushah in the home, when there is, during that time. And uh, unfortunately, our son, our son is, uh, is off the deck to say the least. And the Rabbani tells him a story of a lifetime. And she says, my dear husband, it's time that I tell you a story that I didn't want to tell you. But I have to for the sake of Torah. She says that when I went to the mikveh after all the days of being impure, the big day in Judaism every month is a wedding between a husband and a wife. A husband and a wife that keep tarat mishpacha like they're supposed to, every month is supposed to be as exciting as their wedding day. And if your wedding day wasn't exciting, that, th- that means you did something wrong before it. Wedding day. Unbelievable. First and last time in the world you ever think of anything else. She says, I went to the mikveh. But as soon as I left the mikveh, this Goy Rasha, general of the king, raped me. And I didn't want to tell you. And the sun came from him. What do you think the Rambam did? He ran happily back to the king, as happy as can be. Of course, he's allowed to be with his wife. She's not, there's no, uh, she didn't do it on purpose, obviously, from rape. You're allowed to be with your wife. And she's not even obligated to tell you, so she didn't sin by not telling him. He ran to the king, loves his wife. Nothing changed between them, but he ran to the king. He thanked his wife for telling him. Ran to the king. Your highness. I have an answer. What? Your general raped my my wife. He goes, well, you have proof? She says, yes. My wife gave me the proof. What's the proof? She says that because he did what he did, she bit his entire thumb off. She bit his thumb, his thumb finger. She bit it off. And ever since that day, years and years ago, he wears a glove. So the king says, okay, um, interesting. I'll check it out. The next day, the general comes to the king, and he sees uh, he has a glove. He never noticed it's glove. Why? Who? He never really cared to ask, why are you wearing a glove? He says, uh, take it off. He goes, what? The glove, glove. I want to see the glove. Take off the glove. He says, oh, why? I want to see. Take it off now. I command you. So the general takes off the glove, and he sees he's missing a thumb. He goes, what happened to your thumb? Ah, it's nothing. It's nothing. Your highness. It's just nothing. No, no. I want to know what happened to your thumb. He says, ah, it's nothing. Years ago, I had a little fun with some Jewish girl. I raped her, so I had a little fun. The king liked the Rambam so much and admired him so much, he killed him. He killed the general. Killed the general. But the Rambam was excited to find out such news that all of us would cry forever for. Why? He says, Baruch Hashem, that we have verification such as this even if it's such a kapat avono, it's such a horrible horrible thing to happen Baruch Hashem that I didn't make a mistake in any of the Torah that I wrote the Midrash Sefer Agudat Ezov writes a Sipur Mezazea a story that shakes up anybody it says that the mother of Rabbi Ishmael Ben Elisha went to the mikveh one time and experienced a difficulty, to say the least. What difficulty? For many months or years even, she was not able to bring a child to the world. And Elisha was a holy person. Rabbi Elisha was a holy person. He told her, listen, we have to do something more for Hashem. We have to do something more. What should we do? Take on yourself to not look at anything impure after the mikveh. All of the basics and above, they're already doing. 
do something more. Protect your eyes, the wife, protect your eyes from looking at anything impure after the mikveh. So Bezad Hashem, Hashem sees how much we're trying to bring a holy neshama to the world. He blesses us with a child. So Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha's mom went to the mikveh. She dipped in the mikveh. It's not like today you go to a mikveh, it's Mamash Taj Mahal, quarter million dollars, with the pools, there's a salon in there, there's everything. No, and there's a Mamash hole in the ground in many cases. Surrounded by a few walls for modesty reasons. She goes to the mikveh, dips, she comes out of the mikveh, first thing she sees, frog. Tame. Goes back into the mikveh. Again, the whole process. Goes into the mikveh, comes out, chamo, donkey. Again, goes back into the mikveh, comes out, horse. Goes back into the mikveh, Comes out another animal, a goy, a this, a that, all types of things. How many times? 80 times. 80 times the Midrash says she went to the mikveh that night. Up to the point the Malachi Asharet, the Malachim in Shamaim, went and cried to Hashem, Hashem Itbarach, Hashem, please, please have mercy on this poor woman. Have mercy on this poor woman. Look at the mesirut nefesh she has to try to not look at anything impure. 80 times go to the mikveh. Hashem had mercy and what did he do? He sent Malach Gavriel himself to, to the mikveh. As soon as she left the mikveh, first thing she saw, Malach Gavriel. And that's why the uh, Chazal says, the face of Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha was identical to the face of Malach Gavriel. Identical. Same face. Gemara Maseret Brachot, page 7, says Rabbi, Elisha, Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha, what did he get to in holiness? He got to a level I can't even explain to you. Why? Because the Gemara says Rabbi Ishmael got to what did he get to? He got to a point where Hashem came to him. Hashem Itbarach came to him. He says, my son, bless me. He says, my son, give me a blessing. Hashem, Hashem asked Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha, give me a blessing, give me a bracha. What is he going to say? Misha Barach, what is he going to tell him? Who's going to, what is he going to say? He said, may your midah of mercy overcome the rebuke, overcome the tough issues that you have to bring to the world. May you have mercy on the world. That's the blessing. But Hashem asked Rabbi Ishmael for, for, for a blessing. Hashem asked Rabbi Ishmael for a blessing. Can you imagine that? This tells us, Rabotai, that a person can get to such a high level of holiness that Hashem Yidbarach says, I want a blessing from you. Don't start looking for Hashem to ask you for blessings. First, let's get blessings from a local rabbi, hopefully. That's kosher and has Yirat Shamayim. But Rabotai, this is telling us, it's to, to give us some type of idea of how holy you can be. People always say, what, Hashem really expects us to do all this stuff? Protect our breed, protect our eyes, protect our this, protect our that. Not only expects you to do all of it, but even more. You can be just like them. Why? B'Tsem Elohim. You were created by Tzalem Elohim. You were created in the image of God. You have enormous potential. But that's also why the punishment is so severe. Because when a person violates the Brit, when a person violates their eyes, they're not just causing damage to themselves. They're causing damage to souls that are around them. To other people. And the Rambam says in Ilchot Shuva, chapter 10, the sixth Alakha, last Alakha, it's well known and clear that the love of God will not become attached within a person's heart until he becomes obsessed with it all the time. And it's willing to leave all things in this world except for this. 
meaning all he cares about is loving Hashem. All he cares about is fulfilling his will. All she cares about is making Hashem happy with her. All she cares about is what is Hashem's opinion of how I look. Not what's uh, my cousin's opinion of how I look. Not what's this guy's opinion of what I look. What does Hashem think? This was implied by the commandment in Deuteronomy, love your God, love God your Lord with all of your heart and all of your soul. And a person can only love God as a result of the knowledge with which he knows him. Because the nature of one's love depends on the nature of one's knowledge. A small amount of knowledge arouses less love. A greater amount of knowledge arouses greater love. We need to know not only the nice things in the Torah. We need to know the things that are not so nice to hear. And the reason why, Rabotai, is because if we know the significance of each one of the mitzvot, not just the reward they'll give to us that's impossible for us to understand anyway, but the consequence of violating these mitzvot, then we say, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth it to be immodest. It's not worth it to even be on a gray area. Modest, immodest, immodest by some opinions. It's not worth it. So the Chachamim say, okay, the skirt has to be six inches below the bottom of the knee. So she wears a skirt exactly six inches below the knee. Why? They didn't say it's supposed to be six inches below the knee because that's where you should wear it. See, so that's the minimum. Why are you playing with this red line? Any woman that has love for Hashem, has Yirat Shamaim, has fear of Hashem, has anything for Hashem, she wears a skirt all the way to the ankles. Why? Why am I going to play with this line? Chachamim tell us the clothes have to be loose-fitting. Why? So no one sees what's under. Leave everything to the imagination. Only a husband needs to, to, to know. She wears something that's like halfway loose. Why? Halfway loose, but in her imagination. In reality, it's not loose at all. No, is a pencil skirt fine? For who? For the dog? Yeah, it's fine for the dog to wear a pencil skirt. Dog, no problem if he wears a pencil skirt. Or she wears a pencil skirt, the dog, no problem. For a woman, a bat Israel, to wear a pencil skirt, who told you this is allowed? What book says this is, this is permissible? Who? Who what said this? Oh, but I'm only wearing a wig once a year. Why? I'm not even talking about the women that wear it every day, Hashem Yachem. May Hashem have mercy on them for wanting to look like a sota. Why? I don't know why they want to do it. But I know it's a big desire and they have rabbis that they depend on that unfortunately uh, are undependable. Why? Why take the risk? Why? You said you love God. Express your love. Rabotai, we're going to finish off with the last section that we're going to give a little bit of stuff that's going to help you lose a little bit of sleep. And the reason why is because we need to know this stuff. We need to know the stuff that is going to scare us a little bit because if we don't get scared, we're not going to do. The prophet Job said, chapter 3, I made a covenant with my eyes not to gaze on the maiden. And the prophet Isaiah says, he shuts his eyes against looking at evil. Chapter 33, verse 15. It's both referring to a person who doesn't look at a woman even when they're doing simple mundane things. Isaiah was specifically talking about women that were doing the laundry in the river. So when they were doing laundry in the river, they didn't want to get their skirts wet. So they would roll it a little bit. Not roll it like people wear their mini skirts today or to their knee. Just roll it a little bit where they saw a little bit of their ankle. The prophet says, don't even look at the ankle. The ankle don't look. The Sefer Hasidim says there's no greater barrier to sexual arousal than closing your own your eyes. You see modesty is in down the road. Make a left. Yeah, but it's really far. I can't tell you how many times I almost got into a car accident on the highway, Hashem just because of a billboard that was on the right side that I was 
doing everything I can to look left. Or look right, whichever way it wasn't there. Why? That's what you have to do, Rabotai. I'm not telling you to get into car accidents. It will protect you. But you have to run away from the stuff. It's cancer. It's spiritual cancer. You can't look at anything. Sexual temptation is the main test in life. It's sent as a challenge challenge to refine us. For all those people that ask, why does Hashem give us such a big desire if we're uh, not supposed to do it? It's a challenge to refine us. When you're subjected to this test, it puts you in a type of exile. Lekutei Etzot, chapter 36. The Rambam in Ilchot Deot, chapter 6, says that if you have bad neighbors, move to a different neighborhood. If the other neighborhood has bad neighbors, move to a different one. If everywhere has bad neighborhood, move to the desert, move to the exile. Now we finally understand what the Rambam actually means. What is he? He's not expecting us all to go move to the desert per se. What is he saying? If everyone in your neighborhood is immodest, if your school is immodest and your neighborhood is immodest and your work is immodest and everyone's immodest, close your eyes. Look away. Why? That way you are in the exile. You're in the Midbar. You, they could be working. Gain them for all you care. It doesn't make a difference to you. You don't see them. Close your eyes, Libono Sheolam. Close your eyes. Look away. Train yourself. Train yourself to protect yourself. Why? Because if you protect your eyes, you can actually be able to learn Torah like a normal person. The Rambam talks about, oh, I'm sorry, the Kitve Arizal, Kava Yashal, chapter 68, says that reciting Kriyat Shema Alamita is a great correction for the sin of wasting seed even while sleeping. A lot of people have this issue when they, Baruch Hashem, start doing tshuva, but they don't do it on purpose, but they go to sleep and they have dreams, or sometimes even without a dream, they waste seed during their sleep. One of the ways that you can protect yourself, at least help the scenario until your body heals along with your neshama from all of the years that you've made a sin is saying, Kriyat Shema Alamita. Now, a man should not say, after he reads about all of these warnings, that I transgress all of them, or some of them, but I still don't spill seed in vain. Because it's possible that some drops of semen come out of this person to his urine. And the words of our sages, may their memory be blessed, are holy and faithful, the Chida says. So a person says, listen, I make some of these sins, I look here, I look there, I look everywhere I want, but uh, it doesn't affect me, I don't waste seed. He says, if you're looking, seed will come out of you. How? It'll come out in your urine. And I think recent studies, scientific studies, confirmed that there are actually some people that seed comes out even during their urinating. It's not every time, obviously. It all depends on a person. But if you don't watch your eyes, it's definitely coming out one way or the other. And it's a sin. It's not as grave of a sin as somebody doing it on purpose, but it's definitely not not a big deal. The Zohar Kadosh, as Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, that there's no sin in the world which creates and provokes more anger of the Almighty than the sin of neglecting the Brit. As it says in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 25, a sword that shall execute the vengeance of the covenant. Person weighs seed, he's bringing anger to the world, to his own personal life and to the nation Bichlal in general. A person that weighs seed, the Tzelem Elohim, the image of God that was put on him, when he was created, immediately runs away from him. And the only thing that remains is the beast that's in him. He's considered at that moment a beast. And as long as he doesn't do tshuva, he is like the one who has no portion of the God of Israel and it's forbidden to even talk to him. 
says Zohar Chai, Parashat Vayechi, page 377b. Further, he becomes an evil beast. And on each and every hair of his beard, there are 80,000 demons posing themselves and calling him Tame, Tame, Tame. No, but I keep Shabbos. Tame. Yeah, but I learn Gemara once or twice a day. Tame. But I teach in a yeshiva. Tame. You wait, see, it's all going to the Sitra Achra. The Seder Ayom, page 37b, says it would have been better for him if he would have died in the womb. And he never would have emerged into the air of the world. It would have been better for him if his hands were cut off so that he would never commit this evil act. When a person understands the magnitude of the sin, he understands why the sages say it's better for this person to die. It's better for this person to never come to the world. It's per- better for this person to have mitameshuna. Such horrible things he brings to the world. The Zohar Kadosh says in Parashat Vayechi, all the sins have repentance except for this. Which means that Sharet Shuva are always open, but all of the other things that you're going to do Shuva for, Hashem will help you. The Siyat Vishmaya. That Hashem will help you do tshuva for everything. Except this. You waste seed, tshuva is on your own. Which is the reason why the Rambam says to do tshuva for wasting seed is the most difficult part of tshuva. To almost, it's almost impossible. Almost impossible. Not impossible, almost. Meaning, you have to mamash be afraid, terrified, terrified of your own brit. Which, by the way, explains why many of the sages, practically all of them, were scared to go to sleep. They didn't not sleep because they had to learn all the time. They learned a lot about Hashem. But my Rav explained to me that the Arizal, the Gaon Mivina, the Vida Melech himself, they weren't, they didn't want to go to sleep. They were tired just like you and me. They were scared to go to sleep. Scared to go to sleep. Why? Scared because sleep, you don't have full control of your body. Yeah, but it's not on purpose. Who cares? It was not on purpose. Still creates damage. I didn't kill him on purpose. He still died. I didn't kill her on purpose. She still died. The outcome is the same. It's not that they didn't want to go to sleep. They were scared to go to sleep. David Amelech, is Yirat Shamaim. Never allowed him to sleep more than 15 minutes. 15 minutes. The Gra, the Gaon Mivina, never slept more than two hours a day total. But he wouldn't sleep more than a half hour straight. Why? Never get into deep sleep. He's scared. I'm not recommending this, but this is to show you how much Yirat Shamaim they had from this sin. Accidental part, not on purpose. On purpose. We see in the Torah Akdosha that a minor is exempt from all punishment except this one. Where we see that Eren Onan, the sons of Yehuda, were each seven years old. They were seven years old. They sinned, Hashem killed them. This is a pasuk in the Torah. Before the written Torah came to the world, there were seven Hashem killed him. Sharek Dusha, part 2, section 6. A drop of seed is the secret of the 27 letters of the Torah. 22 Hebrew, or the Hebrew regular letters, and four and five final letters. Otiot Sofot. As it's written in the Kavanot of Tikkun Chatzot. Now when a person sins... When a person spills his seed in vain, he's not called a rasha, he's called ra. Rasha is wicked, ra is evil. Ra has a numerical value 
of 270. Meaning that when a person spills his seed, is the damage is tenfold, tenfold of the 27 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. 22 regular and 5 ending letters. Now some of the things that cause a person to waste seed I already went over in the previous shoe, but there's one particular thing that unfortunately is very common in today's drugged up generation with between the Xanax and the other stuff that people take just to uh, stay afloat. They should know that when a person has Torah, the Torah is supposed to bring him joy. And having joy is not a recommendation, it's a must. Why? Because a person should be careful not to be sad or even sigh. Not even have the ah. Don't even say, ah, man. Don't even do that. Why? Sadness and sighing causes impurity, causes tuma, And an opening for who? The Satan's wife who's in charge of wasting seed. Every single woman you see in your dream is her. We can't say her name. She's so she's so dangerous. We're not even allowed to say her name. You can see her name. I can show you on paper what her name is. I think I've told you guys the name before. But you're not allowed to say the name. Sometimes I have people in the crowd when I say it's like, oh, you mean, and they say the name. I'm like, are you retarded? By the way, nine out of ten times those people end up wasting seed that same night. I don't even have to even ask them. I know. That's what happens. Because when a person is sad, he's adopting her ways. He gives her power to do as she desires with him. Because he becomes hers, in so many words. She defiles him because he belongs to her. As it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, Esef Mazriya Zera, the... Um, the uh, grass that uh, brings on uh, seed. Don't read it as esev, rather etsev. Etsev meaning sadness. Sadness brings seed. The Seder Ayom, page 37b, says this is even more if he thirsts, if his thirst was not satisfied by this, this issue of wasting seed gets worse over time. Why? Because it, once his thirst is not satisfied by wasting seed, he goes on to have homosexual or in, incestual relations. And little by little, the abomination again before God continues to grow. This is the same thing that Rabbi Nachum of Breslov said. When a person damages their breed, the level of Yesod, the foundation, is damaged and the Sitra Achra takes from this person all of his Torah and all of his mitzvot. You just worked your whole life, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years mitzvot. You had a weak moment. You had a weak moment. You just went to a woman you're not allowed to be with. Or you did it by yourself. All of the mitzvot, all of the Torah, everything you ever did for 60 years, gone. Where does it go? Sitra Achra. You just gave everything you've worked for your whole life to the Satan himself. Hashem Yirachem. Is it worth it for five seconds of pleasure? Forget the punishment. You just lost your entire reward. You're going to go up to Shema and say, no, so what kind of mitzvot do you have? He goes, what do you mean? I learned in yeshiva. I went to kolel. I went to this. He goes, sorry. There's nothing here. What do you mean nothing here? I went. I had a yeshiva. No. Nothing here. If you want, we can check the Satan's cheshbon. We check his cheshbon. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're over there on that list. Nisho, look, look at you. Yeah, you did go to that kolel. Yeah, you did finish the shahs. And you finished, wow, nice. Oh, sorry, it doesn't belong to you anymore. It doesn't belong. Remember when you were 52 years old and you didn't want to listen and you did this, this, and that, and that five seconds of pleasure, remember that? Okay, that's it. That's all happened. Good. So there's no, it's not that Hashem is looking for a way to punish you. You have no reward. 
You lost it. It's gone. Bye. Is it worth it? Needless to say, the punishment of what comes to the person. Rabbi Yassi says in the Gemara Maser Nida, page 13a, a person that weighs seed is considered an idol worshiper. Why? Because when you weigh seed, it's the same exact action as the people that worship idols do, or satanic people. They either bring seed from their seed, or they bring blood. Same thing. Blood is actually even less of an essence of the person than a seed is. That's why you'll see all these satanic sick people, they bring seed or blood to their, uh, for their idolatry. A person who falsifies the covenant of circumcision, meaning he gama brit, causes the shechina, which is the unity of the Holy One, blessed be he, to abandon him. And this is replaced by a demon who's ruled over the person. Tikkun Zohar, Tikkun 21. The Zohar Kadosh Parashat Pekudeh, page 263b, says a trend that there exists a celestial being called Patot. Patot. And he induces people to look at forbidden places. There's a specific Yetzirah that tries to encourage you to look at all the places you're not allowed to look at, as men or as women, where there's no need to look at. Why'd you look at that dress? For what? Well, you're going to buy a dress for yourself? What are you buying? What are you looking at the dress for? Why are you looking at the uh, woman? Well, she's your wife? No, she's not your wife. Why are you looking at his daughter? Why are you going to marry her? No. Why are you looking at all these things? There's an angel, his job is to try to get, no, no, look here, look here, look here, look here, look here, look here, constantly. After the person dies, Hashem Yerachem Alenu, what he's about to say here. When the person is already buried, this same angel Patot comes to the grave. And he puts the Neshama back into the body. After they dig even the grave even deeper, they put the Neshama back into the body to raise him up. And the first thing they do is they break the bones surrounding this person's eyes and they take them out. And afterwards, they judge the person with heavy and severe lashes and judgments. God save us. Kavi Yashal chapter 2. Why the eyes? Because the eyes was the beginning of all the sins. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not, sin lies below, sin lies at the entrance. The Hashem says to Cain, It says this verse is referring to an opening. To an opening, if you leave an opening for the Yetzirah, He'll take over you. Meaning, don't just think that, oh, you overcame this sin, it's finished. No, no, no. Don't even leave an opening. Don't even ch- go to that place ever again. But the Zohar Kadosh says, no, it's not just this opening of not going back. There's an opening in your body. There's an opening in your body that if you don't watch it, if you don't guard it, all the sins in the world will come from it. Likutem Aran Rabbi Nachman Breslov says, for a little pleasure lasting a mere quarter of an hour, a person can lose this world and the next. And Lukute Etzot, he says, depression, anxiety. People always take all these pills, Xanax, Percocets, uh, whatever things are off the, on the counter, off the counter, in the counter, whatever they can get themselves. Legal or illegal is irrelevant anymore because the legal is, 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 is poison. The illegal apparently is not. Who knows what's going on in the world today? People take all this stuff. Why? They're all depressed. They're all anxious. They all have no idea what's going on. There's a very, very simple reason. Why? The Kutei Etzot says that depression and anxiety are the main cause of sexual immorality. You're depressed. You have anxiety. There's a source for it. There's a source for it. The foundation of the covenant lies in joy. Now you always ask, how come all these people have the audacity to go against the emet, go against rabbis that say the truth? There's so few of them. How could you go against it? Someone who knows that he's guilty of having wasted the drops of his very mind and soul should be careful not to get involved in any of the conflicts and disputes between the, the tzaddikim. 
He should believe in all of them. The various doubts and questions which arise in his mind when he sees tzaddikim in conflict with one another stem from the mental weakness he himself brought upon himself when he wasted seed. If his mind has not been flawed, he would not have anything trouble him at all. He should understand that all of their conflicts are really for his own benefit to prompt him to examine and purify himself. A person sees certain big rabbis have a big machloket for Shemaim, not because one's a heretic and one actually has Yirat Shemaim, but real machloket between some of Bet Shemaim, Bet Hillel. He says, ah, see, he doesn't know and he doesn't know, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. The only reason why you think such a horrible thought is because of the damage you caused your neshama, your mind. The underlying reason of why we recite the Haggadah of Pesach in a loud voice is because the Haggadah is also a tikkun for the Brit. Because the original exile of, of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, was a result of the abuse of this covenant. The reason of why we were actually in Egypt in the first place is because of immorality. And drinking the wine is a tikkun for the distortion in our consciousness which stemmed from sexual impurity. A person that has wasted seed in his life should cry out to God, scream and cry out to Him over and over again. Just like a woman in labor cries out from pain, from her contractions. Seventy times she cries out, as all Kadosh says. You must do likewise and cry out to God again and again until He takes pity and helps you strengthen yourself and break your desires. So you don't have to go back to this garbage. Different tikkunim for this are give as I told you before, there are many in the previous shoe. Some other things we didn't mention is when you give charity, give charity for this specific thing, a lot of tzedakah for this. If a person only knew how much tzedakah he needs to give for this, you would realize that he literally has to even take his job seriously, not waste time. If you're already being hired to do a job, do your job right so you don't lose the uh, the opportunity. Why? Because that job aside from paying your day-to-day -day expenses, should be used to fix your brit. Charity should be given specifically for this. One of the things that they say in the book that causes people to waste seed is actually dishonest rabbis and judges. We saw this in the Gemara also. Because they pervert the law and make people think that it's okay or it's not bad. Now for all of those people that keep talking about Mashiach, 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 they should know that every Jew has a spark of the Mashiach in him. But this Mashiach has the Midat Emet, the character trait of Emet, he has only cares about his Hashem, which means that the spirit of Mashiach is jealous just like Hashem. With the spirit of his mouth, he kills the Rasha. Who? Somebody wastes seed, you have no chance. No chance if Mashiach comes. All these guys that stay single because they don't feel like getting married. Of course they have to be wasting seed. Either by themselves or with an occasional date and so on and so forth. You should know. You should pray for Mashiach not to come. Why? Because you're the first one in line even before Saddam Hussein. A person that has constantly anxiety where they're scared of irrational things. They're scared that uh, ISIS is going to come to their house in the middle of New York in the middle of Florida, in the middle of Montana. ISIS is not coming to your house. The only reason why you think these irrational things is because of Gamabrit, because of wasting seed. Those demons are causing you to think of irrational things. 
which means that when a person protects their brit, they become totally free, they reach the ultimate enlightenment, they strip themselves of a leprous body they created for themselves and the skin of the, of the uh, serpent, and are now clothed with a neshama, that's the equivalent of Shabbat clothes. We're almost finished. To finalize it all, a person needs to know the following. Why should you protect your breath and why should you be modest? One, if you waste seed yourself or you cause other people to waste seed intentionally on purpose is irrelevant. Your mini skirt caused people to get aroused. Your long wig caused people to get aroused. Your tight clothes caused people to get aroused. You decided to watch TV, watch a movie with immodesty in it, and so on. You should know this applies to you. One, the exile that we're in for 2,000 years of murdering Jews in the public and, and massacres, holocausts, pogroms, and so on, is going to be elongated because of you. Anyone who spills seed in vain on purpose doesn't merit to see the face of the Shekhinah. Person dies, he's, a, he's supposed to see Hashem. After that, after wasting seed, if he doesn't do tshuva, he will not see Hashem. He'll only see bad things. If he doesn't do tshuva, he will not rise the resurrection of the dead. He brings death and plagues to the world. People that learn Torah but still waste seed because their teachers never told them otherwise, this prevents them from understanding the secrets of the Torah. You can learn Gemara from here until you're blue in the face. You're still never going to get to your full potential. It also brings a person to poverty. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, Wall Street executives and Hollywood, um, Hollywood uh, stars, so-called stars, stars of gay gnome, stars, that I, uh, they, they're promiscuous, they go with anything. Yes, you're right, they go with anything, and they're not poor as far as money. Yes, but they're poor in everything else, and most of the time they either commit suicide or bankruptcy, or both. Just so you know, we have actually a person, old personal friend. We haven't talked to her in many years. But uh, she was a uh, assistant to many, many celebrities and powerful people. And she told us, Mamash, this was before we even know anything about this stuff. She said, listen, all of these superstars, they have no, wall, they have no, uh, no line. They go with anything. Men, women, each other's wives, each other's husbands. But the more powerful ones, she says, they go with little kids too and other things. Anything that moves. Why? How could such a thing be? How could such a thing be? Because when a person defiles their breed, defiles themselves, that means they broke all barriers. They've officially become a beast. And now there's no threshold. There's nothing holding them back and it's just going to get worse and worse. We also saw this in the Torah. Where do we see this in the Torah? The Gemara in Maseret Rosh Hashanah and actually many other places talks about the kings. The kings of the uh, Gentile nations. The wicked kings. Nebuchadnezzar used to have uh, intimacy with animals. Belshazzar used to have uh, intimacy with animals. Uh, Daryavish, his wife was a dog. Kings, kings, kings. People that have all the money in the world, power in the world, anything they want. He had, uh, Daryavish had a throne for himself and a throne for his dog. Why a dog? You get any woman you want. Any, all of them if you want. No, no, no. It's not good enough. I know what the doggy. We see this in today's world, Rabotai. There's an entire ring, an entire ring created specifically to cater these sick people that have a lot of money, a lot of desires, and a much beast just for them to take advantage of little kids. That uh, guy that did the movie Borat, I uh, forgot what his name is, some comedian, Jewish guy actually, he has this show that uh, started, uh, I don't know, some time ago, making fun of all types of people. And he said while making the show, they were going undercover. He says he pretended to be some uh, powerful politician or something, and he went to Vegas just to see how far he can get. Oh, can I get this? Can I get this? Just pushing the lines because in Vegas, you know, they, they, they say anything you want, you can get there. 
anything you want, you can get there. So he said, oh, I want this. They got him this. I want this. I got him this. And then he said, let me see how far I can go with this so-called service. He says, uh, I want a, you know, a nice little eight-year-old to have some fun with. Which is illegal and everywhere. They said, yeah, we can take care of that. He didn't, he didn't show this on his show. He says, because we gave, as soon as we saw this, we have a camera recording this guy saying there's no problem of giving me kids to, to Hashem and Hashem do whatever I want with. We knew that there's Mamash, the ring of pedophilia has a station here in Las Vegas. In a regular hotel, you get whatever you want. All they want is money to fulfill their filthy, disgusting desires. Also, a person needs to know that if he doesn't watch his eyes, he's not going to watch his bleat. If he doesn't watch his bleat, he's going to have evil sons. Reshaim. Because they're just like him. And they'll end up becoming heretics and reformers and atheists, God forbid. The Zohar continues. Uh, the Zohar says all of this, and now we're going to go into the Gemara. And also other parts of the Zohar. The uh, Gemara Masech Nida, page 13, says a person that even holds their brit, is bringing mabul la'olam, he's bringing the flood to the world. He's considered as if he spilled blood. It's as if he's serving an idol. He's, he's liable to the death penalty. He's considered to have a major mum. He's considered like a bal mum, like he has a deformity in him. He's considered as if he's on cherem. In Masechet Kala, he says he has no share of the world to come. He has no portion of the God of Israel. The Holy One, blessed is he, is more jealous for this sin than any other sin, the Zohar Kadosh says, Parashat Noach. All the trouble that befalls a person are caused by this sin, Tikkunah Zohar, page 57. His soul goes to complete waste because he can never leave Gehenom. The Gemara in Maseret Rosh Hashanah, page 17, says that a person at Tzarasha goes to Gehenom, but there are certain people that go for a special place. What? What happens to these people? The completely wicked are written and sealed immediately for Gehenom. As it's stated, and many of those who sleep in the dusty earth will awaken, these for everlasting life and these for shame, for every everlasting abhorrence. But what about the ones that are special? says the heretics, the apikosim, the informers, the people that denied the Torah, that did the uh, sins of the Torah, b'faresia, meaning they drove on Shabbat, they wasted seed on purpose, and things of that nature. Even if they just kafu b'tchiat amitim, they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. like Yehovah ben Nevat and his friends, they descend to Gehenom and are punished there for all eternity. And they will go out and see the corpses of the men who, re who rebelled against me. For their decay will not cease, and their fire, the fire that consumes them, will not be extinguished, Prophet Isaiah says. So for all of those people that think that Gehenom doesn't last forever, it's in the Gemara. It's not just Zohar or Kabbalistic books. It's in the Gemara, page 17, and it's actually in other places as well. Tshuva for the sin is the hardest of all Tshuva because the uh, person is putting his soul in the hands of the Sitra Achra. He will not live in the seventh millennium, which is Yemei Mashiach, Olam Abba, and even when he says Kriyat Shema, the Tikkuni Zohar says, it will not be heard. Ad Khan is the scary stuff. Now all of you need to know, all of this scary stuff is for toilet. It's for your own good. 
It's for you to remember. It's not worth it to be immodest. It's not worth it to waste seed. It's not worth it to be one time or half a time or two times or imaginary time. It's simply not worth it. And the only way that we're going to be able to overcome this giant Yetzirah is if we treat the Torah like it's supposed to be treated. As Shlomo Amelach says in Proverbs chapter 2, My child, My child, if you accept my words and treasure my commandments with yourself to make your ears attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, for only if you call out to understanding and give forth your voice to discernment, if you seek it as if it were silver, if you search for it as if it were hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Hashem and discover the knowledge of God. For Hashem grants wisdom in, uh, from His mouth to come uh, to bring to knowledge and understanding. The point is, Rabotai, if we take even the stuff that's hard for us to hear and treat it you know, like it's treasure, Oh, you know what? This is treasure. Why is it treasure? It's going to save me from Gehenom. It's going to save me from Kafakela. It's going to save me from punishment in this world. It's going to save me from having horrible kids, horrible marriage, horrible everything. Once you start, start treating this like it's going to save your eternity, then it becomes much easier to overcome all the obstacles, all the Yetzirah of your friends, your family, your colleagues, your eyes, your ears, your whatever. It becomes much easier. Why? Because you realize it's simply not worth it. It's not worth it. Hashem says Kedoshim to you, not as a advice. Be holy, not as advice. As an expectation. So some of the suggestions I could give people as far as some things that I, I've mentioned people privately but not in the Shurim to, to overcome this. If a person has, especially guys, has a desire to do it, Gemara says, say Shema Yisrael first. That doesn't work, go open a book, start learning Torah. That doesn't work, start thinking about this shiul or the shiul about Gainom that talks about what's going to happen to you once you die. Sometimes even all those three things don't work. So you could add some other things I'm going to mention to you now. One thing is that when a person gets hot, the first thing you need to do is get yourself cold. Go run into the shower, cold shower. No hot at all, cold shower. Sometimes this is going to be just enough to cool you off and you're going to get back to normal. So cold shower it is. If that doesn't work, then take your fingers and pinch yourself in a sensitive place in your body. The back of your thigh, the back of your arm. Don't cause yourself damage and bleeding. It's not necessary. Just enough pain to stop. And get yourself to think about something else. Now... Aside from that, you have to also reward yourself for overcoming this. Not by buying yourself a new car every day, but rather by writing a journal. Every day that you overcome it, one day passes, the next morning when you wake up, after you do your prayers and everything else, think about how good you feel that you overcame another day. Write down that good feeling in a journal. One sentence, five sentences, whatever you need to describe yourself. And describe that feeling. Why do you do this? Because you're going to need this book. When? The next time the Yetzirah comes back and you're already going for 60 days, for 90 days, for 6 months, for a year and a half. Yetzirah is not on vacation just because you're on vacation. He's going to wait for you, sometimes 20 years. But if you're writing this journal for a long time, you're, he's going to come back and say, wait, hold on a second. You know what? You make a lot of sense, Yetzirah, but let me see. Hold on a second. Hold on. I like what you're saying. Hold on a second. It sounds good. One second. Yetzirah. Wait, but this makes more sense. You make sense, Yetzirah, but your cents are really pennies. This is dollars. This is millions. Why? I remember how I felt on day number 18, day number 19, day number 61, day number 187. Look, I wrote it. I wrote how I feel. After all these times, It's I want that feeling because I know how I feel after I listen to you. Hashem Yachem, all of this opposite. It's not worth it. It's simply not worth it. So you take yourself, you write yourself a little journal. That's another way that you can overcome this. Remind yourself constantly of everything we learned in Yeshuim. I have a whole playlist on our YouTube channel, on the website. There's actually a tab that Sanya Tzadik actually made for us called Wasting Seed. Why? All of the Shiurim about wasting seed are over there. 
you should be watching those shiurim on a monthly basis. Man, female, child, adult, rabbi, talmid, everybody should be watching these shiurim. It has nothing to do with me. It's just easier to watch the shiur that's going to give you 150 to 300 sources than go look at each individual source yourself and look for that one line that's going to give you that shamayim. Watch these shiurim. Some of them are long, some of them are short, but you should be watching these shiurim on a regular basis. To constantly remind yourself it's not worth it. It's not enough to do it one time or two times or five times. It's not enough you did it while you were single and now you stop when you were uh, married. By the way, everybody that thinks that this sin goes away once you get married is wrong. It's, in fact, I have more people that are addicted to it that I'm trying to help that are married than the ones that are single. Marriage doesn't solve this problem like some people think. Oh, no, no, just get married as soon as possible. It'll solve the problem. It's not true. It doesn't solve the problem. Number one, you still have to deal with the fact that she's need for half the month. What are you going to do? I have many guys, grown men, tell me, ah, listen, I do everything good, but when she's need I can't take it. I mean, that's the test, you moron. What do you mean, you do everything good? It's like saying, I eat kasher as long as I'm in the house, but as soon as I go outside, I don't eat kasher. What do you mean? But that's the test. That's the test when you're out there, when it's, when it's tough. That's the test. So you have to have Yirat Shemayim. You have to be scared to death. You have to remind yourself of this stuff. Marriage is not going to fix that problem. What's going to fix that problem is being afraid to lose everything. Your relationship with Hashem, Olam Abba, Olam Azeh, your marriage, your kids. Your kids are going to Hashem Yachem, what's going to happen to them, what they're going to be. Why? Because this is what you're doing to yourself. You can't blame God for this. You have a kid that's coming out with Baal Mum, is missing something. It's not Hashem's fault. It's not Hashem's fault. So you have to understand these things that are hard to hear are the only thing that's going to protect us. It's the only thing. If you're not scared of your Brit, you're not going to treat it with respect. You're going to look at it whenever you want. Which brings me to the next point that I've actually, it's helped many, many people far beyond what you would think. As I advised you to do what Rabbi Yudan Nasi said and what he did in his life, he was Rabbi Kadosh was called a Kadosh because he never looked at his own Brit. Not didn't touch it only, he never looked at it. Why not look at it? If you look at it, you become comfortable with it. So what do you do as far as to uh, clean yourself? You don't need to touch yourself to clean yourself. First and foremost, use a sponge. That's not exactly expensive endeavor. You go to the dollar store, you get one for a dollar. If you need, we'll start a fundraiser for you to get the dollar. Okay, get a sponge. That's number one. Number two, you don't need to actually touch the corona when you clean yourself. So the reality is most people say, no, it's for hygienic reasons. You know, yeah, okay, buddy. I'm a guy also. You don't need to. It's not a problem. Same thing with women. Don't get comfortable with yourself. Don't get comfortable with yourself. There's no reason to get comfortable. You have to do your business, clean whatever you need to clean. Of course, their body is completely the opposite of ours. But don't get comfortable with yourself. Also, make sure your kids are not comfortable with themselves. I have little kids, little kids that have uh, don't realize it's bad. Their parents let them do whatever they want. And they have an addiction already before they're 12. And then people ask, why is there so, many tra- so much tragedy in the world? There's so much tragedy because we're killing already without knowing. You want to be holy, you have to do things like this that are difficult and no one is ever going to give you credit for it except Hashem. Why? Because no one knows you're doing it. If you're looking for mitzvot that everyone sees, that's not going to make you tzaddik. That's not going to make you righteous. In fact, it may be the opposite sometimes. To be a real tzaddik, to be kadosh, to be a holy person, requires you to do things that you're not going to get any credit from anyone except Hashem. The things that you do in closed rooms. The things you do in the bathroom. This rabotai is extremely important for Am Yisrael to know. Unfortunately, we're left with only me to tell you. You know, but hey, listen. Makom she'an ish, tishtadil yot ish. Alvaida was a thousand people saying the same thing and uh, you wouldn't need to hear this you. And I'll give you a shield that scares you in a different way. But uh, if that's what we have in this generation, that's what we have. Baruch Hashem, that we have a merit to do something. But reality is it should be a thousand rabbis 
screaming and crying their hearts out, telling Am Yisrael to stop destroying themselves. All these divorces, all of the heresy, all the atheism, all of the conversions to different religions, all of this Zionism, communist mentality, all of it starts with this. We destroy our own breed, we're destroying our own nation. That's exactly what we thought we left behind in Egypt in last week's parasha. We thought we left Egypt because Egypt was a symbolic of wasting seed, giluya rayot, all of the sex crimes. The reality is we're just as bad today as we were back then. But today we have information. We have a solution. You simply have to watch yourself. There are different websites and apps that are going to help guys watch their eyes if you know yourself that as soon as you look at something, as soon as you look at somebody, you're going to have all types of thoughts. They're going to even lead you to a dream or something like that. Go on to uh, websites like Guard Your Eyes and some other similar websites. Bezat Hashem, we're going to get a list of them that we're going to publish soon. Uh, one of the tzaddikim from uh, Canada is putting a list together for us to, uh, to publicize for people. So you have different resources of how to watch your eyes. The reality is some of these tools are useful for some people. They're not useful for others. Because you can't have this uh, software on some uh, computers because you need it for work or otherwise. The reality is, is that you have to do everything you can to protect yourself. But at the end of it all, if you're not afraid to death, nothing will help you. I have one guy, Baruch Hashem, that we helped. And Baruch Hashem, and now I think he's going maybe two years already with it. But he used to tell me, listen, I went to Yeshiva. I went to Kolel. I learned all day. I learned this. I did everything possible. I didn't even have a phone. He said the phone that I had is the phone from the years of Antiochus. Uh, Antiochus is his phone number. Yeah, them on the phone, yeah. But, so, how, so, so what happened? He says, but once a month, I would go to my, I don't know, my mom's house or some relative's house to visit, and they had a computer there or a phone there or something. And I couldn't wait to go visit this relative that I couldn't stand just to go use their computers like Hashem and Hashem do what I wanted. Meaning that all of these tools, the software and the phone, all that stuff, it's all good. But if you don't have Yirat Shamaim, if you're not scared to death to destroy your relationship with Hashem, to destroy your Olam Azeh, to destroy your Olam Abba, at some point you're going to fail. You have to be scared. How? By going over this information over and over and over again and realizing that Hashem gave you the ability to enjoy life physically, emotionally, spiritually, and so on. But there's permissible ways and there's forbidden ways. Once you understand the consequence of every action, you start realizing it's simply not worth it. So this, Bezat Hashem, hopefully will give you some more ideas of what to do when the Yetzirah arrives. Uh, there's many other ideas that I remember having uh, Bezat Hashem on this, so anyone that needs even more ideas of how to stop it or what to do, uh, Bezat Hashem, I'm more than happy to help if you're a very serious person. Uh, but again, remember, the key is Yirat Shemaim. If, you're not, if you don't have Yirat Shemaim, Nothing can help you. Nothing can help you. Even Hashem Himself is limited and He can't help you. Why? If you're not afraid of Him, He can't help you. Any questions? Beside the Rabotai, we have our next shiur on Tuesday at the Breast of Center in Aventura. Beside Hashem, we'll uh, have the uh, shiur, regular shiur about the uh, Prekea Avot series. Uh, this uh, concludes our next installment of Wasting Seed. Beside Hashem, we have some other information to... Uh, We'll do it again, maybe next week, maybe the following week, whenever Hashem gives us the information. Ba'uch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.